All right. So let's see. I think everything should be ready to go. So let's jump in. So um, I was asked to talk about glyphosate resistant kochia. Andrew, for some reason, we can't see your face, but I'm working on that well, on this end. I don't let know me, that sure. actually is probably my fault. Um, let me, let's see. So my camera should be running. I can't see anything, but should be, let me. Um, video settings. Ah, I have the wrong video camera displayed. Oh. That's why. Oh, that's better, right? Kind of. It's a little bit odd. It looks cool. like black and white pixelated. Ah, there, there you are. <laughs> Great. Now you can see my beautiful face. There we go. All right. Perfect. Thank oh. you. <clears throat> you bet. So, um, I'll, I will, I'm going to just be super blunt and honest. I don't have a whole lot of new information to share with you compared to what I shared with you a couple of years ago on glyphosate resistant kochia. Um, it, it's continuing to spread, although I, I will be honest, it's at a little bit lower rate than I would have expected. I, I kind of figured when we first saw these um, glyphosate resistant kochia fields, I, I don't know, I guess in 2011 or 12 or so, I, I figured by now it would be um, a much worse problem than it is. And, and I don't want to like minimize the 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 issue for those that are that are struggling with it because it is really problematic where it exists um, but it is not as widespread as i um, would have expected which is i i guess a good thing um, but that that's what we're we're going to talk about today is really what what we can do with some of the big picture kosha issues just in general um, but then also specifically how are we going to deal with with kochia once it has glyphosate resistance. And I, was, I, I will tell you right now, um, it, it gets way more challenging once we've got glyphosate resistance, which I'm sure most of you are already really well aware. Um, so um, especially in sugar beet, um, this is actually some, some work we did a number of years ago. And, and I know a, a, several of you have seen a slide similar to this before, uh, but we actually, worked with some colleagues at, at CSU, Kansas State, Nebraska, and South Dakota, um, and, and did this at five different sites over a couple of years, where we actually just took like the, the best corn herbicide programs we could think of. So we took the top three, um, we took the top three soybean herbicides we could think of, fallow, wheat, and sugar beet. So we, we spared no cost, we just went for something that we thought would give us good kochia control, but without glyphosate. And so in, in, and again, this is not gonna shock anyone, in corn and soybean, we have a lot of tools available for kochia control and for weed control in general. Um, 90, 98 to 99% control of kochia in, with the herbicide programs that are available in those crops. Um, fallow and wheat, a fairly similar story, 90 to 95% control. We just have a lot more tools, in, mostly because of the, the synthetic oxen type herbicides like dicamba and um, starain and, and that group of herbicides. And then we've got sugar beet. So averaged over the, the 10 sites that we did this, this study, um, we averaged 40% kochia control without glyphosate in sugar beet. And, and again, I, this is problematic. Um, kochia is a really competitive weed with, with sugar beets in particular. It's also problematic in other crops, but sugar beets really are, are the crop that are most susceptible, I think, to, to kochia competition. And this is actually some relatively old data. Studies conducted mostly in the 70s and 80s with this one from, from Abdel up in Powell in 1994, um, looking at sugar beet yield loss based on kochia density. So at one, one plant per meter of row, which is a, a pretty heavy infestation in the grand scheme of things, um, you're looking at 50% sugar beet yield loss, but even at much lower density, so one plant per every 100 feet of row would be in this area, you're already looking at, at 15 to 20% yield loss. So a, a really pretty dramatic um, impact on yield um, from 
the the kosha that that is out there in those sugar beet fields and again it's also problematic in barley and dry beans and, and some of the other crops but sugar beet really is where we see most of the yield impacts with this particular crop and this photo is going to look probably familiar to, to some of you this was taken up near orland um, by Chuck Duncan a number of years ago, showing the, the problem that we've got with resistant weeds, right? And I like to show this to non-sugar beet growers, um, mostly because they often forget that, that there are weeds that are resistant to other things than glyphosate. Um, and this is actually a, a photo in that first year of Roundup Ready Sugar Beet um, that we had up there in, in New Orleans. Um, I think 2008 was, was the year. And this is a split field where half of it is Roundup Ready and half of it is conventional sugar beet. And I bet you can't tell um, which half is, is which from this photo, right? Because um, we've got that ALS resistant kochia, which made it extremely difficult to control kochia without Roundup Ready sugar beet. And so basically what, what we've got now, as we have more glyphosate resistant kochia out there, we're back to this stage because not only are we back to this stage, but we actually have fewer tools now because now we've lost the, the herbicide registration for Betamix, um, which again was not a phenomenal product for kosher control, but it was one more tool in the toolbox. So, so we're now left with only basically half of the, the Betamix that, that is available um, and commercially available, I don't know, just legally available. Um, and Nortron, which gives pretty fair to, to Midland um, control. Um, upbeat is phenomenal if the kochia is not resistant. But again, even 10 years ago, 15 years ago, um, about 70% of fields in the Bighorn Basin already had ALS resistant kochia biotypes around. And so I, I doubt that has gone down. So I would guess most fields um, in, in that neck of the woods have ALS resistant kochia, which, which means upbeat, upbeat is probably gonna bring limited value for kochia control along with all of the other SUs that we have in, in barley and some of the other crops in the rotation. So um, obviously the, the, the problem that we're dealing with, particularly in sugar beet, and again, it, it's problematic elsewhere, but I'm focusing on sugar beet just because I know that's, that's kind of where um, a lot of you are focused. Um, there are no herbicides registered for sugar beet that provide effective control of kochia once we lose glyphosate. So glyphosate is pretty much the only tool that gives us really good consistent control. So once we lose that consistency due to resistance, um, we're in kind of a bind. So, so one of the things that's on the horizon, and I'm presenting this data to you, one, just to kind of get you in the mindset um, of what we're going to be doing maybe in, in the next seven to, to 10 years. Um, but also just to, um, I guess, give you this information because I know some of you that are looking at say some reduced tillage sugar beet are actually looking at some of these other herbicides either as a burn down pre-plant or, or something like that. So I wanna give you some of this information. So, cause I, I do think it'll be useful to some of you now, uh, but hopefully it'll be useful to all of us um, you know, in, in 10 years, once we get the, the new triple stacked herbicide resistance in sugar beet. So the, the new triple stack um, HT2, I think is what they're, they're currently calling it. Um, I, I don't remember what the trade name is going to be once it finally hits the market, but um, those, that, that um, beet herbicide resistance package is going to have glyphosate resistance or so resistance to Roundup, dicamba resistance. So resistance to um, you're not going to be allowed to spray Clarity, but the, the dicamba-based herbicides, um, I think Extendamax and some of the others will should have a label for that one once it comes out. And then glufosinate, which we most of us know as Liberty. Um, it was trade, trade named as Ignite for a while, and I don't know exactly why, but they went back to Liberty. So now it's Liberty or Liberty 280 is the glufosinate. Um, so glufosinate is more of a burn down type herbicide. It doesn't translocate nearly as well as glyphosate, um, but a fairly effective herbicide in the Midwest. We struggle with it a lot more out here in the Western US. Um, now, the thing to keep in mind again for kochia, we already have glyphosate resistance in the area. Um, we've also had on and off pockets of dicamba resistance 
throughout Montana, Wyoming, Nebraska, Colorado. Um, it's out there, it's present, and that's something that we also need to keep in mind. So, so just going in, again, we're, we're talking probably still several years away from having this triple stacked herbicide resistance. And two of these three active ingredients, we already have resistance out there too in kochia. And the third one is much less effective than either glyphosate or dicamba. And so, so that's one of the issues that we're going to be, be talking about. So um, I actually worked with, with beta seed the last couple of years to try and look at some use patterns for glufosinate, the, the Liberty herbicide, to see if we can like help it work better. Um, and so there's, there's a few obvious things and, a, and also some less obvious um, ways to help, help with this. Um, one of the things I was interested in looking at is just increasing the rate. Like, can we just apply more Liberty? Um, that's the solution to all of our problems, right? You just spray more herbicide. Um, and, and to some extent, it, it often works, right? But you, you also reach kind of the point of decreasing returns where you're, you're increasing your costs for really no benefit in weed control. Um, but we're also in the, the glyphos or the new triple stacked sugar beet traits. We're going to be limited on how much we can use by the, the crop residue tolerance. And my understanding is it might actually be a little bit less than some of the other Liberty Link crops that are out there on the market. And, and I don't know what that number is going to be. I don't know how many fluid ounces per acre we're going to be able to apply either in a single application or in a sequential type use pattern. Um, but that's one of the things we want to look like. What, what, what is the rate that we really need to be at to try and get the most out of this particular product? We also looked at repeated applications of glufosinate, um, not quite back to the, the days of micro rates where we're spraying every you know, five to seven days, um, three and four times. But I did want to look at repeat applications of glufosinate for kind of a similar idea where you know, maybe if we apply twice, especially since coverage is such an issue for glufosinate, that maybe we can get better control with similar amounts of the product, but applied twice during the season at a relatively short interval, like on a seven or, or 10 day interval. So we, we wanted to look at repeat applications of glufosinate. Um, and that I think is gonna be the part that, that might be useful to some of you now, although it wouldn't be ideal. I know no one's excited to go spray a, a you know, two burn down op applications before they plant. Um, but I do think maybe some of this information would be, be useful. I also looked at trying to optimize some of the adjuvant systems. So um, I know there's a lot of outfits out there who are telling you use our product because it will help you control resistant weeds. Um, I would encourage everyone to always be exceptionally skeptical of that claim because there is no adjuvant that can help you control a resistant weed if it's resistant to the herbicide that you're applying. Um, now that said, we can get really useful um, improvement in weed control efficacy with certain adjuvants with certain herbicides. So ammonium sulfate is one that we know almost always helps glyphosate work well. It almost always helps glufosinate work well. Um, and in fact, I would, I would prefer to see no glyphosate or glufosinate um, herbicide go out without ammonium sulfate in, in some way, shape or form. Um, but the, the adjuvant that I was kind of interested in looking at here was actually looking at herbicides that had some sort of a humectant property. Um, and the humectants are basically products that keep the droplet wet, that keep the droplet in more of a liquidy or even gel type form for longer on the leaf surface. Because once the herbicide droplet dries out, um, the, the herbicide molecule basically crystallizes and it can't make its way into the leaf's leaf anymore, which means you're not going to get any effectiveness. Um, so looking at some of the herbicides that provide some sort of humectant properties, and a lot of our oil-based adjuvants will do this, um, will actually keep that droplet wetter for a little bit longer. In ho and, and the theory being there that maybe we'll get more into the leaf surface if it's wet for longer on that leaf surface. And this is some work that, that one of my students, um, Carl Coburn, did a, a number of years ago just in some growth chamber studies where we actually looked directly at the effect of humidity on glufosinate. 
because I will tell you, when I talk to my colleagues in the Midwest about glufosinate, um, they agree that, you know, it's not glyphosate. You can't go in and spray a, a two foot tall weed and expect it to just die. Um, it, it is a contact herbicide, it doesn't translocate. But that said, they get really effective control. If they sm spray small weeds, four inch weeds, um, glufosinate is just death on almost everything um, in, in the Midwest. And, and part of our thinking on that was, well, they have a much more humid environment. And so maybe glufosinate is able to get better penetration into that leaf and into the plant and have you know, more effectiveness in that environment compared to the more arid, dry climate that, that we work with. And so this is some work that, that Carl Coburn did um, while he was at U University of Wyoming. And so this is looking at the effect of humidity before we applied the glufosinate treatment. And he had high humidity, which he was keeping at about 80% humidity constant, and then low humidity, which we were keeping in the 25 to 40% humidity range. Um, and in, in this particular case, the humidity before we sprayed the glufosinate didn't really have a huge impact. So there's really not much difference here. Maybe at the lower rates of glufosinate, the high humidity helped control, but we're still talking only, you know, 40 to 60% to control in most cases. Um, but the humidity after treatment, so if we adjusted kind of those same ranges for 80% humidity after the herbicide application or 25 to 40% after the her herbicide application, there we actually saw a pretty dramatic difference, especially at the, the use, the higher use rates where we're, we're talking, you know, 80% control in that high humidity environment compared to again, 40 to 50% control where we had the low humidity after treatment. So that's kind of one of the things that made me think, well, maybe if, if we had a humectant adjuvant, we could more, more closely simulate this type of environment to get better control of that kochia. Okay, so the, the treatments that I'm gonna show you for this study, so we did field, three field studies over the last couple of years to try and look at some of these things. So we looked at glufosinate at a range of, of rates. So we used Liberty 280, the, the new version, anywhere from 22 fluid ounces per acre up to 41 fluid ounces per acre. Um, and we always had ammonium sulfate in that glufosinate treatment. Okay, we looked at repeated applications at seven days apart. So again, I mentioned earlier that we wanted to look at kind of the, the sequential idea there. So we basically came in with 22 ounces um, on the same day we applied all the other treatments, but then seven days later, we came in and sprayed another 22 ounces. And we also did that with the 29 ounce rate um, just to see if those sequential applications improved control. And then we also looked at a range of adjuvants. So we looked at glycerol, which is just a straight humectant that really doesn't give us any other properties. It doesn't have a surfactant. It doesn't have any of the oil-based um, benefits. It's really just um, something to try and keep the droplet wet. We also looked at a, a pH buffer, which acidifies the spray solution. We used Hellfire for that. We used a high surfactant oil concentrate, which was superb HC. And we used um, methylated seed oil plus NIS combination adjuvant, which was dynamic. And again, I'm giving you the trade names just so you're aware of what they are. Um, but I personally have no reason to believe at this point that any of the MSO NIS would differ substantially from dynamic in the performance we got. Same with the HSOC and HSOC, Superb HC or Destiny HC, um, or some of the other manufacturers that have similar products. Um, I assume at this point, these are pretty representative of, of what we would see with, with any of those adjuvants on the market. So I'm giving you the information, but not necessarily saying these particular products are good or bad. Okay, so again, we did three field studies um, and two of them were on kochia. And I'm also gonna show you what we saw in the irrigated trial where we had only common lambs quarters as our species that we evaluated. Um, in the irrigated corn, we had much higher humidity on the day of application. We actually averaged 70% for the 24 hour period of on the day of application. Um, and again, we sprayed most of these in the morning. So most of this is in the 24 hours following application, which again is, is the most important. Um, so the humidity there was 70%. And on the follow-up application, which was when we timed our seven day after, it was a little bit lower of 60. 
So for the, the kochia, though, on the dry land fallows, we did this in a fallow setting up on our dry land because we wanted to stress the weeds. We wanted these things to be difficult to control, just really see if we could see a separation in treatment. Um, so we did a pretty decent job on the, the first application in, in, in both years, um, 50 to 60% average humidity, which again, the average is all, all day and night. And so the, the actual humidity that these plants were exposed to is probably closer to the minimum for most of the time after application. So in that 12 to 35% range. And then the second application, a little bit more humid in both cases, um, but 2020 was a much drier year. And so we did actually get really good stressful conditions, which is what we were trying to get with this work. And here is the kosher control averaged over both years and um, kind of a lot going on here. But the, the thing I want to draw your attention to are these top three treatments. So there's a, so this is kosher control um, 21 days after the first application. So basically all of the treatments have been applied. We've got the sequential treatments on where we're looking at basically the overall kosher control from all of these treatments. And you've got three treatments here that really do separate themselves out from the pack. So a fairly clear break between these top three treatments and kind of everything else. And those top three treatments were the, the sequential application. So Liberty at 29 followed by 29 ounces seven days later, 22 followed by 22, 29 followed by 22. So in, in both years, those sequential applications were substantially better than anything else um, within this treatment list. None of the single applications, the, the higher rates, the adjuvant systems, nothing really approached the same kosher efficacy as two applications spaced about seven days apart. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting is we didn't see any real benefit from having 29 followed by 29 compared to 22 followed by 22. So as long as you've got that sequential application out, you're actually fine at the lower rate in both cases, which again, um, Liberty is not a cheap herbicide. And so, so that's probably good news. You know, if you're going to have to spend the money on, on a second application, being able to go at the lower rate um, is, is probably good news. So um, that's really the nuts and bolts of this. Um, I will draw your attention to the other, I guess, important points was that we did not see much of a rate response. So we've got 22, which did a little bit less um, kosher control compared to 41 ounces. Um, but for almost twice the rate, um, one would have expected much better control. And so, so I actually think the, the 22 ounce rate, which is generally speaking, the recommended rate, and, and my guess is probably the range that we're going to see um, recommended for the, the new traded sugar beet. Um, that 22 ounce rate was sufficient, like going way above that is not really all that helpful in the grand scheme of things. Um, and then finally, the, the other thing to keep in mind is our oil adjuvants, and this is relatively well known. Um, oil adjuvants don't really work well with Liberty. Um, and you can see Dynamic, which is an MSO and surfactant based, Superb HC, we're bringing up the tail end. Next to glyphosate, which at this site in the, in the 2020, at least we did have um, glyphosate resistant kochia. And so we would expect that those treatments would not perform nearly as well. So again, Liberty um, does appear like, like it can be really helpful, um, but to get the most out of it, it does, looks like it is gonna require those sequential applications. So again, if this is useful for your, to you for your burn down applications, again, it's not ideal to have to go spray twice before you even plant. Um, but if you are in a bind with life series and kosher, you have no tools in the sugar beet crop, this is something that, that you might be able to consider. Um, again, I'm just going to show you the photos of some of these plots because I, I think it, it helps show what that level of control really means. So this is the non-treated control, so mostly kosher out there. We actually also had some prickly lettuce and a little bit of um, some, a couple mustards out there. But um, most of the green you see in most of the photos is actually going to be kosher. Um, because actually both Liberty and Roundup did a pretty good job on the prickly lettuce and but struggled more on the kochia. So that's kind of what you'll see left in most of these photos. So there's glyphosate at the 22 fluid ounce rate. 
So the three quarters of a pound of acid equivalent. There's glyphosate at 32 ounces. So not a big difference, a um, little bit of difference, but not a big one between 22 and 32 ounces. And again, we have confirmed that we have glyphosate resistant kochia on this site. I doubt all of these plants were resistant, but we do have in this strip on the research farm, glyphosate resistant kochia now. So, so that though is the difference between the 32 ounce rate of, of Roundup there over on the left side of this photo compared to the, the highest rate of Liberty alone. So this is 41 ounces of that river, Liberty. Uh, again, with just AMS as the adjuvant system, looks pretty darn good. Um, there are a number of stragglers. And so, you know, a couple weeks later, there will be a little bit more green here, but overall um, that looked pretty good. But, and again, we didn't see a huge decrease in the amount of control we got as we dropped from 41 ounces to 36 ounces to 29 ounces. We do start to see a little bit more of a drop off from 29 to 22. Um, you can see some of the yellow plants, although even those toward, you know, the longer this, this went out, um, we really lost those visual differences between 22 ounces and 41. So we do see 22, there, there being a little bit of a break between 22 and 29, um, but overall, not a huge difference in any of these single applications. Um, but where we go with the sequential application. So this is 22 fluid ounces followed by 22 fluid ounces a week later, um, like really just a lot of death. So we had very few plants come back from that. And we did have the 29 followed by 29, but again, not really any substantial difference between those two differences. As long as we had the, the repeated application, the seven day spacing on two applications, things look pretty good. Um, and it didn't seem to matter whether we had 29 or 22 ounces in the take, or if we flip flopped them at 29 followed by 22. Um, and so this is the lambs quarters control. And I'm not gonna show you photos of the lambs quarters, but I did wanna show you just the, the same treatment structure. And once again, if you look at the, the top three treatments, we do see the Liberty sequential applications. And in fact, the, the top two here was where we had the 29 ounces in the first shot followed by um, either a 22 or 29, a slight drop off, not statistically meaningful, but a slight drop off where we had 22 followed by 22. And all three of those sequential treatments actually did better than our glyphosate. And we don't have glyphosate resistant common lambs quarters. Um, but the reason we did this trial was um, common lambs quarters is probably the most difficult weed to control. And if they're not resistant, um, common lambs quarters is one of the most difficult species, just generally speaking, to control with both Liberty and Roundup. And so really the, the take home messages here, as long as you have the sequential applications, um, it does seem to provide at least as good a control of common lambs quarters and kochia as the, the Roundup does. Now, if you use only a single application, now we're below all of that. So Roundup does definitely perform better on common lambs quarters than single applications of Liberty. And that's not surprising, um, but the sequential applications actually did make a, a pretty marked improvement in lambs quarters control compared to Roundup. So just as a general summary on glufosinate and trying to help glufosinate work for us, um, which again, I hope will be useful to you once we get, get the triple stack sugar beet, but may be useful to some of you in the meantime as you're trying to find tools that will help you manage this species either in fallow or, or non-crop or ditch banks or things like that. Um, the oil adjuvants consistently the worst treatments. So I would encourage you to shy away from throwing an oil adjuvant in with the, the glufosinate herbicide. So if you're using Liberty, don't use an oil adjuvant. It, it pretty consistently reduced control. Um, I was disappointed in the glycerol treatment. It didn't really seem to help. I thought I was really onto something with some of that humidity work um, and it didn't work. And so that was kind of a, a bummer for me personally, um, but hopefully um, we, we're gonna keep pursuing that and see if we can help something there. But, um, and then finally, the, the repeated applications provided excellent control, at least as good, and in most cases better than glyphosate for both kochia and for um, common lambs quarters control. Okay, 
<clears throat> so that is what I've got for Liberty. I'm going to spend the rest of the time kind of um, just going through some basic ecology. Um, and I'm, I, I don't know how much of this you would, you would like to hear. Um, so I do have a, a, a question for the group. And, and I don't know if you guys are feeling in a chatty or talkative mood. Um, what I would like to know is, do you want to hear more about some basic kosher biology? Or I've also got a herbicide resistance um, app that might help you plan herbicide programs. Um, and it's pretty herbicide focused, but also will actually kind of show you how well you're doing from a herbicide resistance management standpoint. Do you guys have a strong preference on which you'd like me to spend more time on um, for, for the next 30 minutes or so? Do you wanna hear about the the decision support tool to help you plan herbicide programs, or do you want to hear more about kosha biology and how we might structure crop rotations or cover crops to help manage some of these resistance issues? I'm sorry, what did you say? Okay, so there. Is that seems to be that the support tool is the is the vote here as opposed to the biology? Is that what you're saying? Okay, that seems to be the general consensus on our end. I knew it. No one ever likes it when I talk about biology. Hold, hold on, just a second, Andrew. What was The other question is nozzles. There's a lot of claims about nozzles that make them better. So that was another question that came up. I know okay. you have a time constraint, Andrew, but we do not, I think, because Bill said he's very flexible. So whatever works for you. Okay. Well, I'm going to, I will start out with this and then I, I might just open it up to questions and, and specifically about the nozzle thing, because I, I am probably almost as skeptical about nozzles as I am about adjuvants. Um, but that said, nozzles can make a, a tremendous difference. And so, so um, I will probably spend a little bit of time just letting you know about this. Um, I think some of you have seen this before. Um, this is actually a, a web-based tool. Um, and I'll give you the link here in a little bit. So if you have your phone or tablet, you can, you can play around with it as I'm talking and ignore me if, you, if you'd prefer to do that. But um, this is something that actually Western Sugar supported this. Um, they were the ones that funded development of this and are helping us kind of pay the, the web hosting fees to keep it online. Um, but this really is a tool um, to try and help you develop herbicide programs that are not reliant on any particular herbicide mode of action. So um, Nevin Lawrence at, at University of Nebraska and Albert, who was a PhD student in and postdoc that worked with me for a while. He's now at the University of Idaho, actually. Um, just started in Don Morishita's old position for those of you that, that might've known him, another sugar beet weed scientist. So Albert's gonna continue working with, with beets also. Um, so we, we developed this basically to try and help out figuring out how to best implement multiple effective herbicide modes of action. Um, so I'll, I'll spend just a, a little bit of time and, and I know I've presented some of this information um, to this group before. Um, but one of the things we talk about, and, and Dr. Stump is going to probably talk also about mixtures versus rotations. Um, things are a little bit different in the Circospora versus the, the weed world. Um, and I'm going to show you one of those differences right now. So this is actually from a study that Hugh Becky did um, up in Canada. It, it, it's still one of my favorite studies. He published it in 2009. Still one of my favorite research papers I've ever read, just because it was is really fascinating. Because we talk about trying to incorporate herbicide diversity to manage resistant weeds, right? We talk about you know rotating Roundup Ready crops with something else the next year, um, which we do that pretty much all the time up in the basin. Um, even if you're only on a two-year rotation, you're going from you know Roundup Ready sugar beet to non-roundup ready something else, usually barley, um, maybe throwing some beans in there. Um, so we, we use a lot of herbicide rotations. Um, but from a purely theoretical standpoint, mixtures 
um, are more effective. So a, a herbicide mixture would basically be, you may be rotating from Roundup Ready Sugar Beet to barley, but in both years, in addition to the rotation, you're, you're applying multiple effective herbicides. So you're applying Roundup plus something else that works, uh, which in Roundup Ready Sugar Beet is not really a thing that exists because we don't have multiple effective herbicides for kochia. Um, but again, every little bit helps. So, so the, the, the pure theoretical side of it says mixtures should work a little bit better than rotations, but both should be effective. Okay, so, so this is actually some data that, that Hugh did up in Canada where he, he put this to the test, where he, used, he basically went out to a field and seeded actually field pennycress in this grower's farm. Um, and he actually spiked that field pennycress that he seeded out on the farm with 5% ALS resistant seed. So just using that as kind of a marker to see how resistance spreads over time. So he had um, one treatment where he always used then the ALS inhibiting herbicide. So he used it every year and nothing but the ALS resistant herbicide. And in the time of this study, which was a five year study, um, they went from about 5% resistant seed to 95% of the, the seed in, in that treatment was now resistant to the herbicide, which is exactly what you expect, right? This is exactly what we recommend not doing is relying on a herbicide that is gonna drive resistance. So we, we try not to do that. Okay, and in these two treatments that I've got highlighted in yellow here, um, here they never used the ALS herbicide, and it basically stayed the same. So a slight drop from 5% down to 2%, not statistically meaningful, um, just because the seeds kind of fluctuate from year to year. So where they didn't use ALS herbicide, where they never selected for that trait, they ended up with really no change in the resistant seed bank. So they actually saw almost the exact same results where they used a herbicide mixture so here they always mixed the ALS herbicide they were using with a second herbicide with a different mode of action that also was effective on pennycress. And that had basically the exact same effect. So as long as you're using an effective mixture, we're using two modes of action that are both effective on the herb, on the weed. Um, they actually saw the exact same effect as if they had never used the ALS herbicide. So that's what we want, right? We want to basically keep the resistance trait in check. Now they started out with 5%, but the numbers like the, the increase and decrease would be the same if we started out with one in a million or one in a billion. And so the, the idea here is, you know, we want these numbers to remain low, whatever low means, um, wherever our starting point is. So mixtures were shown pretty conclusively that they worked really well. Now, he also included some herbicide rotation treatments in this study. And this, I think, is the, the really fascinating part of this study because he had all combinations. So he had, again, continuous use where he used it four times in four years. And then he had different rotations where he used the ALS inhibitor, say, three times in the four-year period, two times in the four-year period, or one time during the four-year period, basically to look at the effect of something that we might think of as a Roundup Ready versus not Roundup Ready type rotation. Where you, you, where you might rely exclusively on glyphosate this year, but then not use it next year or for the next two years. And in those rotation treatments, what he found is if, if they applied the ALS resistant um, or the ALS herbicide three times out of four years and nothing but during those years, um, they actually saw it basically gave the exact same resistance level as if they used continuous four times in four years. Okay, so that's three times. So that's obviously not a great scenario. But even if they only used it two times in four years, so this is basically, again, that every other year type of rotation that we often hear recommended for resistance management. Even if they only used it twice in four years, again, not really any different than if they were using it continuously. So once you've got that resistant seed out there somewhere, it can increase in prevalence really quickly. And if you are using that herbicide on its own, even just one time, you're basically saturating the ability of that particular resistance trait 
to take over that population. And this is one of the reasons why it kind of sneaks up on us, right? We don't see resistance, we don't see resistance. And then like one year we might see a patch and then next year the whole field is, is enveloped. And this is kind of what's going on. So even if you only use it one time in that four year period by itself, you have now over half of your, your weeds are now resistant to that herbicide. Again, if your starting point was about 5%. If you're starting at one in a million, this might be only like one in a hundred, but that's still a, a massive increase in the proportion of resistance that's out in that field. Okay, so um, the nutshell take home message from this is rotations really aren't all that effective for herbicide resistant weed management, um, especially not in a proactive sense. Mixtures much better, okay? So that's what, what we wanna focus on. And the reason this works is really just math. Um, if you consider you apply any particular herbicide that gives you really effective control of kochia and use it well enough or often enough, um, obviously you're going to kill all of the susceptible plants and only leave those resistant ones behind to produce seed, reproduce the whole works. Okay. So you will eventually select for resistance. Like it, it's a, it's a, it's not even a question. It will happen. The question is how quickly will it happen? Okay. If you mix herbicides though, you're going to slow that process down. So this would be say an example of glyphosate if we had glyphosate as herbicide A, and let's say we're using something like Nortron as herbicide B. Now it's, it's definitely better than nothing. It's going to slow down resistance. But if you think of the numbers again, if you're controlling most of the weeds with glyphosate, but you're letting a few resistant plants escape, you can think of the efficacy of the second herbicide in this case as basically giving you 40% control of those resistant biotypes. And so if, if this leaves behind, say, five resistant plants in a given year, so one small, one small um, part of this little patch of plants, you leave behind five resistant plants. The herbicide B in this case is only going to kill two of them. And so if you've got relatively low efficacy for that second herbicide, it's, it's definitely better than nothing, um, but it'd be way better if we had a second herbicide that were effective. And so, so under this scenario, um, it's still gonna evolve resistance. You're gonna slow it down a little bit, but probably not all that much. And so this is the ideal scenario where you've got two herbicides that are both really high efficacy. Because then what happens is, okay, let's say those same five plants are not killed, are, are resistant to herbicide A, which might be glyphosate in this case. Herbicide B then would have a 95% probability of killing those five resistant plants. And so now you're gonna have to have a lot more plants that survive the first application in order to have a high likelihood of it surviving both. And so again, it's just a pure numbers game where you're much better off if you have two highly effective herbicides. Okay, so that's the, the, the nutshell to this. Um, and, and the first question that comes up when I talk to growers about this, and sometimes the students in my weed science class is, who can afford to apply you know, two effective herbicides for every weed in the field? And, and that is a legitimate question. And, and it's difficult because you're talking about going from glyphosate, you know, $20 per acre for a couple applications to some combination of herbicides that might cost you anywhere from 50 to, to $200 per acre. Um, that, that's a tough sell. Um, and I get that. And so that's really the, the basics of this app that we put together is to try and um, help you play through different scenarios to figure out a herbicide program throughout your crop rotation that will actually work. Um, so here, if you type this, and I will email this to, to Caitlin, she can help distribute that to you guys. Um, but the bit.ly slash herb risk, and I think this is case sensitive, so you wanna capitalize the, the H and the R. Um, and you can type that into your phone or tablet or, or um, computer now or later or write it down on a napkin and take it home with you. 
Um, but basically what we've got this app to do, and, and, and I might, I think I've got enough time here, I'll just probably um, share a screen where I walk through this actual scenario, um, where it will give you the, the options for herbicide choices that you have. Um, the app knows what those active ingredients are and what the modes of action are. And I have lost my screen, so I can't see anything. So hopefully you can still hear me. Um, and it will also give you a cost estimate for those herbicide treatments. Are you guys still with me? Oh, man. I still hear you and see your screen, Andrew. Hey, Caitlin, can you hear me again? Yes, we can hear you, Andrew. We still can't see you. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna leave my video off for this time being. It's fine. And I'm gonna share my screen to show the app because I, I think my PowerPoint crashed my entire system right there. Oh, dang. So I'm not gonna bring PowerPoint back up. So we're gonna do this. Oh, can you give me permission to share again? There you go. Go ahead. All right. Got it. Looks good on our end. Okay. So I'm actually just going to type in that same address, Herb Risk. And I will just spend a couple of minutes walking you through um, what this thing does, um, because I, I do, I'm hopeful it will be helpful for you. We tried to design it with our kind of local regional growers in, in mind. So um, basically for this um, program to work and be helpful, you need to think in terms of of a four-year crop rotation. And part of that is because re resistance doesn't happen in one year, right? We, we don't see resistance because of what we did this year. We see resistance because of what happens 
over a period of time. And so, so in this case, we've got to do a four year crop rotation. Um, and so I'm going to go say with sugar beet in year one, I'm going to say choose um, small grains. And I will tell you our small grains section is not great right now where the, the next improvement we're gonna make is actually to try to break down winter wheat, spring wheat, barley. It's kind of all bulked into small grains right now, which is not ideal. Um, but that's hopefully a, a change we're going to be making in the next year or so. Um, then I'm going to go sugar beet again, and then we'll throw dry bean in the mix. Okay. Once you select a crop, um, it will actually then just provide a list of the herbicides that are currently registered for use in that crop. And so let's say we're just going to use glyphosate post. That's the only only herbicide we're going to use in sugar beet. And if once you select a weed species, so let's select kochia, um, then it will start giving you information down here as you start filling in these boxes. So for the cost, um, it's going to give you an estimate if you're only using glyphosate. Again, this is only one application, about one to five dollars per acre. So you multiply that by three if you're going to use three applications. Okay, in the second year for small grains, let's say I'm going to apply, boy, I'm trying to keep my crop rotation. Let's say I'm gonna use Husky uh, plus 2,4-D post is what I'm gonna use in my small grains. Rotating back to sugar beet, let's say I'm gonna use sugar beet or glyphosate only again. And then in dry edible bean, Let's say I'm gonna go Prowl plus Outlook followed by Bassagran. Okay, so once you've entered all of that information in, and I don't know how easily visible it is, so you choose a weed species, your four crops and your herbicide programs. What this will then do is it will one, it will give you a fairly conservative estimate of the weed control efficacy you can expect. So again, for kochia, if you have glyphosate in sugar beet, you can assume you're gonna get better than 90% control. And I think that's a, a fairly reasonable estimate. Again, we're, we're being conservative. So um, it's probably, if you don't have resistance, gonna be over 99% control. Um, but again, we're trying to be relatively conservative with those numbers. Um, just because this is really what, what most of the weed guides will tell you, you can, you can conservatively expect. Okay, and in year two for small grains, the Husky 2,4-D, we're talking 70 to 79%. So, so that's actually a little bit lower. Maybe we want to do something to try to improve that. And so we can actually then go back in and tweak our herbicide programs in order to make sure that efficacy um, estimate is high enough, high, as high as we want it. Year three, again, glyphosate. Year four for the Prowl Outlook Bassagran, we're talking somewhere better than 85% um, for 40 to $48 per acre. Okay, so, so that's the efficacy and the cost information. But the what I, I think is the most useful and kind of unique part about this, because you can get this information just about anywhere, um, is the herbicide resistance risk scores. So for kochia control, based on, again, the multiple modes of action information um, that, I, that I talked about earlier, um, it will tell you, okay, which herbicides are you using? What is the WSSA site of action group within those herbicides? And then it's going to give you a risk score. So the, the goal in developing a herbicide program from a, a resistance risk standpoint is if you keep these risk scores below one, I am fairly confident that you are doing a really good job to manage herbicide resistance. Okay, so in this case, we've got two scores that are not below one. So one basically means once you've reached the, the threshold of a risk score of one over a four year period, you are selecting for resistance. So for glyphosate, that one's pretty obvious as to why. Because it's relatively high because we're using nothing but glyphosate in the first year and the third year of the crop rotation. 
And so that's a high risk. So again, we're, that's including a rotation, but not a mixture sort of scenario, which means um, we've got a relatively high likelihood of selecting for resistance to glyphosate in kosher. Okay, the other one that we've got here is this 2,4-D, which is site of action four. Now, 2,4-D doesn't provide great kosher efficacy anyway, but this does suggest that we are selecting for resistance to the group fours in part because we're using it in a less protected fashion. So basically what this is telling us is that the year that we're using 2,4-D, which is the second year in our small grains, our model basically is saying Husky is not providing that great of kosher control. And so you're putting a relatively high amount of selection pressure on the 2,4-D for glyphosate resistance. So that's basically how you interpret those numbers. Again, the, the cutoff is you can have scores anywhere from zero to four. Anything less than one means you're doing a good job. And so tweaking your herbicide programs in order to get all of these values below one at a cost that doesn't make you red in the face um, should be the goal of, of the program. So we can tweak this by saying, let's apply, um, let's apply Nortron Pre. Um, in both years where we grow sugar beet, um, we can change our um, herbicide program in year two. Maybe we'll include Starrain. Um, and then in dry bean, we can throw in some Raptor because that's the last year of the rotation. So we don't have to worry about any crop rotation restrictions, right? Okay, so. As we do that, again, it adjusts all of the costs, it adjusts all of the efficacy. So now we've got really good efficacy across the board. We're getting good kosher control. Um, we're paying a lot more for it, but we also have reduced our risk score. So we're still um, relatively high risk for the group four herbicide resistance with 2,4-D and Starane, um, and still relatively high for glyphosate. But again, Part of that is just because we don't have a lot of tools for kosher control and sugar beet. Now, the other thing you can do then is you can go and see how that same herbicide program will work for a different weed species. So let's say we're worried about Palmer amaranth moving into the area and causing problems. We can actually choose Palmer amaranth from that same thing. And we can see what the effect is of that same herbicide program on Palmer. And so again, we're getting still mostly good weed control um, and our risk for glyphosate is still the highest. And for Palmer, we actually have other tools. So we can actually come in and let's say we're gonna try using some um, warrant as a post-emerge or as a lay-by product, try to get that on early um, in addition to the, the Nortron Pre. By modifying that again, you can see we're getting relatively good weed control. And now you can see the glyphosate risk factor is now under one. So for Palmer, um, this looks like it would be a pretty good set of herbicide for this four year crop rotation um, to manage glyphosate resistant Palmer. Um, that same herbicide treatment for kochia, you know, it's not terrible. We're, we're keeping that glyphosate at one, but again, the goal should be to try and get it underneath one. But again, the more times you grow sugar beets in this four-year crop rotation, the less possible that is, again, because we just don't have that, very, that many tools within that sugar beet crop. So that's basically how this works. Um, one other feature that, that's probably worth mentioning is you can actually tell the program if you already have resistance on the site. So if you already have glyphosate resistant kochia, then you can come over here and click on this slider, the group nine glyphosate. Say, I already have glyphosate resistant kochia. And that will actually update the efficacy and the risk scores. So now for kochia, it dropped the weed control efficacy that we're likely to get in sugar beet down to 70 to 79% because Warrant and Nortron, um, I would say that's really, um, a friendly rating, I would guess it'd be a lot less than that. But again, it, it's giving you, it's reducing that efficacy because glyphosate is gonna be assumed to not be effective anymore. 
but also you'll see that it takes glyphosate out of the risk scores now, but now we have a much higher risk of resistance for Nortron and Eptam, the two herbicides that are in that group eight, because again, glyphosate is now not able to protect those herbicides for, for resistance to this other group of herbicides. Um, so in a nutshell, that's what I've got um, for this particular um, set. So I guess I would be happy to answer any questions that you have um, relatively quickly about um, the, the nozzle questions. Um, Again, I don't have a lot of information on that, but if there are specific questions related to that, I'd be happy to, to try and do my best. Does anybody want to come up here and ask a question? If you come up here, he can see you and hear you better. Andrew, this is John Snyder. Um, just John. A, we've been, uh, or I've been seeing a few things on different nozzles that are supposed to be more effective than others. I guess just briefly, uh, you said you were a little suspicious about that. So um, I guess just give us a little bit of, of information that you have. All right, so, so I will just give you my big picture um, slant on nozzles. So there's a lot of talk on nozzles, particularly in the, the Midwest, Mid-South, um, primarily as it relates to the dicamba drift issues they're dealing with, with some of the dicamba resistant crops there. Um, so that's where a huge proportion of the, the talk about nozzles is, is coming from. Um, and there it is a really big issue because they are, and, and, and we're getting a little bit of that pressure. It doesn't seem to be nearly as, as dramatic here, but the goal in a lot of the nozzle talk is to reduce the number of small particles that you're applying. Just because those smallest particles are the most susceptible to drift. Okay, and so anytime you're doing that, if you're trying to create much bigger nozzles or much bigger droplets with your nozzle, that always is going to cause a trade-off in the ability to get good coverage. So there's always this trade-off, unless you're going willing to go spray it like 40 or 50 gallons per acre, which I know um, some of you are, are spraying at like eight to five gallons per acre. Um, unless you're willing to spray a lot of volume, those larger droplets are going to reduce the nozzle size or the, the droplet size and going to reduce coverage of the weeds. Now, the, the impact of that varies dramatically depending on which herbicide you're using. So glyphosate, for example, glyphosate tends to work best if you have a concentrated droplet. And so low gallonage is actually usually a good thing for glyphosate control um, because the more concentrated the glyphosate molecules are in that in, in any given droplet, the better efficacy we tend to see. And that, that's within reason. I, I'm not saying go spray at one gallon per acre because that, that will be a total train wreck. Um, but honestly, eight to 12 gallons per acre is great for glyphosate. Um, now, if you increase the, the droplet size for glyphosate and decrease the coverage, it's going to be a little bit of an issue, but not much because it only takes one or two droplets getting onto the leaf surface for glyphosate for it to translocate and work. So, so the impact of a nozzle is going to have a way less impact for that particular product. Now, if we compare that to glufosinate, which is kind of the, the opposite situation where glufosinate, um, we tend to see a little bit better results where coverage is really good. So we want lots of droplets on every part of the leaf surface. Like that's the goal for a, a Liberty application um, because it doesn't translocate well once it's on the plant surface. So basically the parts of the plant you cover are they gonna be the parts of the plant you die, that die. And so you need relatively good coverage. And so high gallonage is one way to get there. If you switch to a nozzle that produces large droplets it will help you with the drift situation, but if you combine large droplets with low gallonage, like that 10 to 12 gallons per acre range, 
you are probably going to substantially decrease your control of a contact type herbicide like Liberty. Now, there's a lot of claims out there, and, and I'm not a nozzle guy. I, I will tell you, I don't follow all of the trends in, in what they're doing with nozzles. The, the nozzle people are brilliant, and they have some great products out there. Um, but you, you, you still can't escape that, that physics. Like if you have large droplets, you need higher gallonage in order to make up for the coverage with a product like Liberty. And that's really the key is we need to, to make sure we're marrying the, the droplet size to the product that we're applying and, and always keeping in mind the total volume as, as part of that equation. So there's nothing magical about a nozzle tip. All it's doing um, is delivering different sized droplets. Like that, that's really the nuts and bolts of any particular nozzle. And so the, for any nozzle you use, it's really important to know what the distribution of those, those droplet sizes are. Because if it's, if it's producing larger droplets, which is what EPA wants and which is a good thing for drift reduction, we need to make sure that we're using a product that, that is okay with that or we're adjusting our total gallonage to account for the reduced coverage that we're likely to get. So I, I hope that's helpful. Um, again, I, I don't know that I wanna cast any kind of shade on, on the nozzle manufacturers, distributors, sales, because there are some phenomenal products out there that, that do a great job of getting good coverage at different volumes and things like that. But um, you can't escape the physics of the situation where you need to balance the, the, the volume with the droplet size. Got another question here, Andrew. <clears throat> Andrew, how are you? Doing all right. How are you doing? Good. Uh, so I guess my question is, uh, when we do get these stack traits, uh, are we going to be able to tank mix? Have you know, hearing what you just went through and the differences in volumes that maybe glufosinate requires versus glyphosate, uh, probably not going to be able to tank mix those two products. Have you been thinking about what our plan of attack in sugar beets is going to be as we use dicamba, glufosinate, and glyphosate together? Uh, second question, um, around our area, from what I've seen, the resistant kochia have sourced from farmyards, fence lines, those situations. I don't believe to date that we have sourced a resistance issue from field practices. So uh, that's pretty encouraging. And in fact, those sourced, uh, those outside field, non-field sources have been for the most part eradicated within the field once they reach there in our area. So not to say that that's gonna hold up for very much longer, but that was encouraging with some of our rotations. Yeah, that, that's good to hear Vance. Um... I, I, I'll start with your second question first. Um, I, I am happy to hear that. And, and I, I do think the, the rotations we've got up there, especially the, uh, you know, especially a lot of the tillage that still goes on. Um, I actually think that's one of the reasons why the progression, the, the spread of this problem has been slower than I think a lot of us anticipated after we saw those, those first few cases. So, so that is promising. Um, definitely keep me in the loop as, as we learn more um, and as it, as it spreads, hope to, to continue keeping it in check. Um, so the, the first question, that's a really important point is as we start talking the, the triple stack trait, um, the, the application recommendations that we currently have for those three herbicides, glyphosate, dicamba, and glufosinate, are absolutely incompatible with each other. Um, and so you are absolutely correct that we, we would not ever recommend going out and spraying glyphosate at the same application parameters that we would recommend spraying um, glufosinate. Dicamba is yet another beast because in addition to the efficacy, which it would actually, we would prefer to see dicamba like just from a purely biological and physics sense, 
we would prefer to see dicamba go out more similarly to glyphosate because it's a, a, a translocatable herbicide. It's very, it's more similar to glyphosate in the way it absorbs and goes into the plant and moves around in the plant. But from a application side of it, the restrictions associated with dicamba are probably going to be more similar to what, what we're going to be dealing with with Liberty. Um, and that's again because of the volatilization concerns, the offsite movement, the potential for dicamba to cause problems in, in other crops and landscapes and things like that. Um, and we're, we're going to have to deal um, in our area, even though we've been using dicamba pretty successfully for a lot of years, we are going to have to deal with the problems that have been caused by the disaster mess they've got going on in the, the Midwest and Mid-South. Um, the, the extend soybeans, the off-site movement they've had there, like EPA has, like they're, they're dealing with the problem and, and this is not their fault. I'm not calling them out. EPA is doing, a, I think their best job to keep this product available. But you know, the, the tools they have make it difficult for them to say, okay, you guys in Wyoming keep doing what you've been doing because you're doing a great job, but you jerks in Tennessee have got to get your shit together. Mm -hmm. um, like EPA doesn't really have a good way of doing that. And so we are going to probably, by the time we see this trade in sugar beets, we're going to be punished. And I not really punished, but you get the idea. We're going to be bound by the same restrictions that they're having to follow there in a very different environment. And I just don't see any feasible way around that based on the, the regulatory process and the tools that EPA has at their disposal to manage those issues. Um, so all that said, yes, it is a problem. And one of the things that, that Nevin Lawrence at University of Nebraska and I are doing this year is to start trying to figure that out. So, so we're looking at kind of all of the products on their own we're looking at, at the various tank mix combinations. And Nevin actually has a, a pretty big protocol just looking at nozzle types and pressures associated with some of those mixtures. So I think he actually has a graduate student that's gonna be doing basically that work. Um, so I don't know if I've got the capacity, I'm still trying to figure out whether I could do the, the nozzle type um, sort, sort of work in my program. Um, but yes, it is something we're considering it is something we're starting right now. Um, 2021, we are going to have trials looking at that and how that those combinations impact efficacy. So hopefully by the time we actually have the trait in our hands, we will have answers, we will have recommendations, we will have some path for you to use all three tools successfully. Um, we, are, we are not there yet, um, but I'm, I'm fairly confident that we will have those answers before the, the you're able to actually purchase the trait. We got one more. Um, my question is more of a timing question on glyphosate. Um, when we first started doing it, I think our, our recommendations were to go out and spray fairly early, seven or 10 days later, do another application. Um, and we've kind of gone away from that anyway on our own farm we have, and we kind of wait later on in the season and, and do a second or third applica application. Do, have you done any studies like the Liberty where you do the first application of glyphosate, come seven, 10 days later, do a second, and how much more effective is that? So that's actually one of the things that we are also planning um, this year is to look at some of the sequential use patterns. So, um, and, and part of that is just purely from a practical standpoint, for the reasons we've just discussed and that Vance brought up, I don't know that tank mixtures of some of these products are going to work. Like I, I just, I don't see a, a way that we can make glufosinate glyphosate um, compatible in a tank mix situation. And so one of the things we are going to be evaluating is figuring out, okay, knowing that glufosinate is not as effective as glyphosate, knowing the weed spectrum, the emergence patterns of the different weeds we're trying to deal with in these different geographies, like what should our, our recommendation be for the, like the order and the, the time span in between? Um, 
because and 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 my initial feeling is, you know, I'm going to want to see dicamba as a pre-plant um, burn down type residual effect because we're going to be able to apply a lot more dicamba in these these beets than we would normally um, in a, a corn type situation. And so I think there's going to be possibilities that we can actually use the dicamba trait to actually get us some residual control, which actually might allow us some flexibility for the post-emergence applications. But yeah, that, that is a question. Like, should we, should we go out with, with glufosinate first and use glyphosate to kind of clean up or fix some of the problems? Um, or should we like do that the opposite? Use Liberty as more of a late season, newly emerged, but risk not having any tools available for kind of the, the rescue type situation. Um, so I don't have any answers on that right now. Uh, but again, it's another one of those things that by the time this trait rolls out, um, I'm fairly confident we will have those, those questions answered or at least have a really good solid um, framework to figure out you know, when to use what. Uh, but my guess is the label is going to allow you to kind of back up different app applications of different herbicides. So my guess is you'll be able to apply a Roundup followed by dicamba at like a, a very short interval, maybe even the same day if you wanted. I don't know who would do that. But um, but for the, the same product, I think they're going to be much more restrictive. So one of the things with, with Roundup is I, I think like the label requires that you have to wait at least seven days or maybe even 14 days. I haven't read that label in a while before you can apply a Roundup after a previous Roundup application. I think we're still going to be bound by restrictions like that for the same product. Like I don't think we'll be able to go Liberty followed by Liberty on a two day interval. Um, I do think there's going to be a seven or 10 or 14 day period in between. Um, but I don't think we're going to see similar restrictions when we change from one product to another. So I do think there's going to be quite a bit more flexibility there with this, this new trait. Andrew, one more question. It seems uh, kind of a common problem that we're seeing. Um, especially with these side-by-side uh, -side sprayers where we're running the side-by-side -side and then the sprayer behind it. And so we've got four sets of tires, actually eight tires on the ground causing dust. Yep. Really poor control uh, right behind there. A lot of guys have gone to a bigger nozzle um, in that spot. We've tried these wetting agents. We've tried different things. Doesn't seem to help. Um, we're even seeing them in some of the big sprayers now where we've got really poor control in those, in those wheel tracks. Can you help us out with that at all? Um, the short answer is no. Um, I, I will tell you though, the, one of the, my, my favorite photos that I ever took in the Warland area from that first year Roundup Ready Sugar Beet, um, I still use it in my class to this day, was just two perfect tire tracks running through the field where we didn't kill any of the common lambs quarters from that Roundup application. Um, like there, there really isn't a solution to dust on the leaf, um, particularly for glyphosate, because, you know, once glyphosate gets bound up by one of those soil particles, dust particles that's on the leaf surface, um, it's not getting into the plant. Like there's, there's just no way to overcome that. So the only real recommendations that, that I have, and you're not going to want to hear this, but slow down, um, stop trying to drive 32 miles per hour through the field as, as, you're, as you're doing that. Um, that's probably the, the, the best thing. And I know everyone's probably annoyed with me right now for saying it, but that, that's going to be the number one recommendation. Um, the other things that you can do though, the, the only other kind of best options is make sure you are using kind of the, the highest recommended rate of ammonium sulfate. So ammonium sulfate will help counteract that dust to some extent. It's not going to be perfect, um, but the ammonium um, sulfate particle, so, the, so glyphosate has a net negative charge. And so it's going to, when you mix ammonium sulfate in, the ammonium part of that has a net positive charge. And so it's going to actually make a, a salt that is more likely to get into the plant than a glyphosate plus 
really any other um, cation salt. So the other side of it though is the sulfate will help bind some of those cationic particles that might be in the dust. So the only real thing you can do other than driving at a, a, a slower speed is make sure you've got ammonium sulfate in the tank at, at the fully recommended rate, which is usually 17 pounds per 100 gallons, um, which is about 2% weight to volume or 2% or volume volume if you're using one of the, the liquid type products, but make sure you read the label for whatever you're using. Um, so ammonium sulfate, drive slow, and the other thing you can sometimes do that might help, but not guaranteed is increase the, the gallonage a little bit. But again, um, with glyphosate, that's a, that, that's a tricky thing because as you increase the gallonage, you're also reducing the concentration within the droplet, which can actually potentially have a negative effect as well. So the, yeah, driving slow and AMS are probably the only, the only two things that I think will help with that particular problem. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. We really appreciate your time this morning and it was great to have you um, share some good information with us. We're gonna take a quick break here and then turn it over to Bill. All right, I'm looking forward to seeing you all in the real world sometime soon. So fingers crossed we can have, I'll, I'll be there in person next year. Sounds good, thank you. Can you hear us, Bill? You're up here in a couple minutes. Did you ask me something, Caitlin? I just said, are you are you ready? You're a couple minutes. We're just taking yeah, a couple minutes. Yeah. Are you guys on break or? Just real quick, just like two minutes, a couple minutes. Okay. Thanks yep. for your flexibility this morning. I appreciate it. Sure. You can go ahead and share your screen whenever you're ready. Okay. Doing a quick coffee restroom break here. There we go, it looks good. Okay. Right, I'm gonna hit the restroom too. Okay. Bill, I think everyone's back in the room now. Okay. You can um, start when you're ready there. Uh, we can't see your face though. It'd be nice if we could see you. Yeah, I'm looking, I've lost my controls here. Hold on. You should be able to basically just drag the, 
dr drag the, the square that has your video into the screen share. Can you do that? Can you see me now or? No. Huh. Let me That's see if good. I can do it this way. Side by side speaker. Okay, I, we can see you now. You're off to the side, but we can see you. So that's good. Thank you. Okay. Okay, go ahead. It's all you. All right. Well, thanks for having me come out today. I'll say too, like uh, Dr. Kniss, that you know, I think I gave a presentation on this uh, two years ago, and or a year and a half ago. So I really, I, I hate to say, there's not a lot of new to talk about. There's no new silver bullets for circospora leaf spot control. Um, I will um, kind of go over some of the issues that are in hand right now. And also I'll, I'll, I'll mention that there is some exciting new um, variety that's out now. And I don't know that much about it, but I'll get to that toward the later in the talk. So I'm going to mostly um, focus a little bit on some of the biology, just in terms of identification and things like that, because we're still getting growers and even fieldmen when we do our circospora lease surveys where we'll get um, samples in that actually aren't circospora. And there's, there's quite a number of different pathogens that actually will, um, can easily be confused with circospora. So circospora leaf spot is caused by the fungus circospora beticola. And basically we find this disease anywhere sugar beet is grown in the world. So it is, it is a big issue um, for most growing areas. Um, and I didn't even realize this, they grow sugar beets in Greece. So it's, you know, it's a problem in Greece. It's a problem in Europe. It's a problem in all the uh, beet growing areas in the United States. So it is a ubiquitous kind of problem throughout all our sugar beet production areas. The reason why it's a problem, of course, you know, as this, this picture indicates, severe disease will cause leaf death and leaf drop. And so you can see that plant and typically it'll start losing the lower older leaves first and then the plant will start using stored sugars to produce new leaves, which is not good for um, sucrose production. And there's been a lot of different studies. We'll see uh, sucrose losses up to 42% um, from some data, but there's been, there's been quite a number of different studies showing um, some of the yield losses. Um, some of the other problems we do have is, of course, we have reduced root tonnage um, because we're losing leaf tissue, we're losing photosynthetic capability of the plant, so the roots aren't getting as big. We're also seeing reduced quality of the beets. There's higher impurities, and a lot of, we don't really know why that is. Um, there's more impurities, and so we get a lot more um, increased sugar loss to molasses, things like that, because of the circospora, which does produce a toxin, a uh, circosporin, and maybe that has something to do with that. We don't really know. Um, can you see my own slides here? Um, and then there's increase is in storage decay as well. Some of these beets are a little bit stressed and things like that, so they don't store as well. And so, and also we have a lot of lower profitability because of a multiple fungicide applications. In some areas, like in the Red River Valley or in Michigan, you know, they're, they're applying fungicides up to six to eight times a season. And you know, that gets pretty expensive. You know, in the old days, they used to manage circospora strictly with resistant varieties, and we didn't really have a lot of fungicide options. And now um, our production practices are kind of geared around using fungicides to kind of solve these problems. Now to show you um, some of the yield effects of, from my research, so I'll, I'll be the first to say, you know, when we do research in southeastern Wyoming, circospora typically isn't a huge issue, so we do we do inoculate our plots, but a lot of times we don't see problematic disease, maybe once every four or five years, and a lot of times it comes in late. So you can see that we'll see a lot of fluctuations in terms of, you know, how our management options in, in affect yield. So I've got up here um, some of the number of years that we've done research, we've done quite a number of them. And these years I've kind of put under light disease. Typically that means the disease kind of came in late in the year. It wasn't a huge issue. And then I've got light to moderate disease um, where we had a little bit more 
we actually had some defoliation and, and some of those um, dead, dead lower leaves occurring within the field. And so what I did is I took the untreated, untreated check here and what the, um, what the yields were and then the treatment averages with the fungicides. I, I took usually the better treatments and just averaged and what their yields were and then a plus or minus if there was yield losses. And so you can see here, you know, some years we even had little reductions. And again, uh, during the light years, we see that more often. And I think that's mostly attributed to us traipsing through the fields, um, uh, walking through. You know, we've, I've actually see, shown that walking through fields with our backpack sprayers actually will decrease yields a little bit. And so I think that's a lot of what's going on there. But up a couple of years, and I think it depends when the disease came into the plots, we saw some pretty big boosts in yields, especially this year. I was really surprised with our yields this year. We had really poor yields this year. I think our averages um, were like 18 tons per acre. They just weren't getting the water to our plots this year for some reason. And also it was uh, very weedy, but um, where we had our untreated check where we allowed the circospora to take off, we had to, you know, really almost half as amount of the yield it was. So it was a huge effect this past year. More realistic though, is these, the disease numbers here um, where I'm seeing anywhere from 4% uh, up to 33% increases in yields with controlling the circus with fungicide applications. And these were average of about three applications a year um, with a 14 day interval. So even in our plots, we are seeing a positive benefit um, to using fungicides to control this disease. So a little bit on the biology, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I wanna make sure you guys understand better on how to identify this um, fungal pathogen. Again, you know, in terms of as way funguses go, this one's typically a late season onset disease. Um, usually in our areas, we start seeing it once we start getting that row closure. And the reason why that is, you know, in our environments where it's fairly dry compared to say the Midwest where they get disease coming on a lot earlier, usually we need to have that row canopy um, covering so we get those increased relative humidities within the canopy. And that's typically when we start seeing disease. Other areas where it's a lot higher humidity or they're rain fed agriculture, those more wetter conditions, they may see diseases a little bit earlier. Um, but even in those areas, again, it's typically a late season um, disease in terms of chronology. And again, low, low older leaves are attacked first. Uh, I think it's because the close proximate, proximity to inoculum sources. The Cercospora spore is long and thin. It's needle-like, and I'll show you some pictures. And it's not very aerodynamic. And so the, the, the rule of thumb has always been it doesn't really travel very far. So I think what's happening is if you've got inoculum source from plant residue in the soil, things like that, that spore doesn't really travel very far. So again, that's probably why those older leaves are attacked first. And of course, the lesions are circular spots about an eighth an inch in size, purplish brown borders, um, gray tan center. And at ri high relative humidity, if you walk out in the, in the early year or early in the morning and things like that, you might see a gray blue fuzz. Basically that's because it's producing spores within those lesions. And also you'll see tiny black dots, which are the stromata in the lesion centers. Um, and again, when it gets really humid, the spots will start merging, coalesce, and you get vast areas of leaf death here, like you see here. Um, again, showing those close up of these um, pseudostromata. These are, the, um, these are the resting structures of the fungus, and this is where it produces spores. So it is a polycyclic disease meaning it produces um, multiple generations of spores within a year. And disease is very much favored by high humidity and temperatures between 60 and 86. So here shows the, um, the life cycle. So this again is gonna illustrate the polycyclic nature of this of this fungus. So if you start here at the bottom, Cercospor is going to survive an infected beet leaf residues. And so when those leaves die and fall to the soil, 
um, those stromata are still present and they'll, they'll survive, you know, up to a couple of years in a soil environment. And so then uh, the following year under proper conditions, um, you'll have spores being produced on those stromata and then those will in turn infect the plant. And so once the plant is infected, there's a period where the fungus grows within the plant and it starts producing those lesions, you can get new spore production and you get a repeating cycle in here. So if you have good favorable conditions, this repeating cycle here repeats about every 10 to 14 days. That's, you know, it's partly why some of our spray um, rotations are based on those, those cycles as well. Um, so every 10 to 14 days you're getting millions of new spores being produced. And that's, again, this is why it's a polycyclic disease and that's why you can get an explosive development within the field. Okay, so identifying Sarcospor. So again, I'm gonna kind of go through this so people kind of understand what they're looking for in the field. Because like I said, there's a few other diseases um, that actually can be very much confused. And every year we see this when our, our samples where um, people are sending in actually uh, samples are actually not Cercospora. So here's some Cercospora leaf spots, typically what they may look like. Sometimes you'll see little variants, especially depending on, um, I don't know if it's based on the varieties perhaps, or the environmental conditions. You know, sometimes you'll get a very dark ring here, um, other times not as much, but there always should be those little dark specks in the middle. You can barely see it on this picture. But again, the pathogen produces a toxin called Cercosporin, and, and the reason why it's that purple pink color is actually that's the color of the toxin. When we grow these in our Petri plates, we'll actually we'll turn the Petri dishes that color um, because of that toxin being produced. And it causes that, um, those lesions to develop. And of course, the stromata, um, this is a key identifying factor um, in these lesions. And of course, these are lesions that are a little older as they start mature. You get these little black specks in there and they're quite small, like little freckles. And these are the specks then will the produces um, the new spores, uh, the asexual spores for the repeating cycles. So here's that fuzziness that you can see. Um, again, under high humidity, what happens to those, um, those black specks will actually start producing these structures here that then they produce these long needle-like spores. So here's another one. We don't see this one too often, but every now and again we see this, this is bacterial leaf spot. And again, this one, it can be very uh, confused with uh, um, Cercospora leaf spot. But again, it's not going to have the little black specks in the center. So the black specks in the center are the, like, the key identifying things in terms of, of differentiating these um, from the other pathogens that may cause similar kind of lesions. So again, here's that bacterial leaf spot. There's no stromata within that lesion. And so that, that, that lesion is probably just due to bacteria. And again, this one's not a very common disease. We see this every now and again, and usually it's fairly sporadic within the field. Now, another one we're seeing actually more and more is alternaria, um, which we see here in the center photo. And again, it's very similar in appearance to the Cercospora. Another one is FOMA. And FOMA is also another fungal disease. You see this one earlier in the season. I think alternaria usually comes in earlier too. So, um, but FOMA is going to be a larger lesion, much larger than Cercospora. And you'll have these rings in it, these targeted rings. So that kind of differentiates it. But the alternaria looks fairly similar. It can too get a little bit larger than the Cercospora. But again, it's got the similar color attributes, but it's not going to have the little black specks. And some areas like in the Midwest and Michigan, they're actually starting to see quite a bit of more alternaria, which is interesting because it's always been kind of described as a weak pathogen. Uh, we actually see alternaria leaf spot in potatoes as well. Um, we also see it in sugar beets. And they're actually even starting to see some, well, I guess it's not funny, some fungicide resistance within those populations as well. But a lot of times, again, it doesn't really appear to be as much of an economic problem as the Cercospor does, but again, it will confuse growers on what they actually have out there. Again, showing some different spots. 
The red arrows are the cercospores, the yellow arrows are the alternaria. So they can even occur on the same leaf. And again, the alternaria um, under high humidity will have a kind of blackish um, velvety appearance to it as it starts producing spores, whereas the cercospora have more of that silver cast to it. So again, just little tricks to kind of identify between the two, um, you know, in terms of what you might be seeing in the field. Again, here shows alternary leaf spot. These are quite large ones. Um, I usually don't see them quite as large um, like that, um, at least in this area. And then here's that foma leaf spot again. Um, again, these are again, quite large lesions. And these ones typically will come much earlier in the season than you would see Cercospora. Again, not a huge economic issue. You'll see this kind of sporadic within the field. Okay, so addition to the problems we mentioned before, as you guys are probably all aware of, is we have a lot of fungicide resistance now with Cercospora. We have fungicide tolerant resistant strains to all our major classes of fungicide chemistry. Um, the benzimidazole, which aren't used a lot anymore, but they're starting to kind of revisit some of them. This will be your topsin. Your strobilarins, um, some areas in the country, particularly Michigan sugar, um, pretty much can't use headline anymore. Um, it just, they have so much resistance in their area that that's kind of been taken out of their tool belt. And within our areas, and I'll show you here some numbers in it pretty soon, it still can be used fairly effectively, especially when tank mixed. Uh, the DMIs or the triazoles, again, we've got resistance strains to those. And I didn't add on here too, we've actually had resistance strains to the tins as well. Um, not lately, but years ago in uh, the Red River Valley, um, when they first started combating fungicide resistance, it first came with the benzimidazole, where they were using um, topsin and benlate. Uh, I think benlate's no longer being manufactured, but they had a lot of problems with that. So they switched to using tins quite a bit and they were using tins exclusively and they actually um, selected for some resistance strains to the tins. And thankfully, once they quit using tins, those resistant strains kind of went away. And so um, we've been able to use tins with pretty good effect. And actually that's been a real, real important tool in terms of tank mixtures, which I'll show in a minute. Now, some of these fungicides are qualitative and quantitatively inherited. And so what that means, and I'll go over that again in another slide. When you have qualitative, it's a yes or no issue, okay? Because of one gene mutation, um, if you have that gene mutation, you can just dump that fungicide on and it just doesn't work anymore. So it's a yes or no issue. And that's kind of the issue with um, benzimidazole and somewhat with strobilarins as well. Once it gets that G mutation in there, if, if that's the isolate strain we have, um, increasing rates doesn't seem to help at all. Now with the DMIs, that's more of a quantitative inheritance. And that means where there's multiple genes involved. It's kind of like analogous to um, Roundup resistance where it's a multiple gene kind of thing. So the more of those multiple genes you have for resistance, the more of an issue that Roundup is not gonna work as well we're seeing this kind of similar situation with the DMIs. And so that's why it's real important, and I'll cover this again in more detail, to always use the highest recommended rate to help control some of those quantitative um, isolates you might have out there. So what is fungicide resistance? Of course, resistance again is a stable, inheritable trait that results in the reduction of sensitivity to a fungicide by an individual fungus. So that means that that fungus is no longer able to be controlled um, by that fungicide, whereas it used to be able to be controlled by that. And we, we, what we see is a lot of practical resistance. Again, we don't have a complete, um, you know, when we talk about all the different funguses out there, you typically don't have all resistant fungus. We have a mix out there. So, the, but the practical of it is you have enough of them, your labeled rates of fungicides is no longer providing commercially acceptable control of the disease. So it just doesn't work as well anymore. I mean, that's the practical side of it. And then also you'll see the terms resistance and tolerance thrown about. And I'm as guilty as anybody too, where I kind of 
use them interchangeably, but there really is a difference between the two. Um, resistance, I, resistant isolates are not controlled by normal field applied rates. So if you have a labeled rate and you're applying it and you have resistant isolates, then you just don't get the control. It just doesn't work. Now a tolerant isolate, which is a little different, means that's more of that quantitative um, kind of issue where you get a reduced level of control with normal field rates. So, you know, you have enough or resistant or enough tolerant or resistant isolates out there, but you still maybe have some tolerant ones as well, or um, susceptible ones, sorry, you still get some control, but there's a reduced level of it. It's kind of confusing. Um, so you'll see these terms thrown about interchangeably a lot. So leading to that, I already talked about that a little bit, is qualitative resistance. Again, that's your sudden loss of control, typically from one single mutation in one gene. And they've identified those genes, like for, for the strobilarins, like your headlines. Um, they actually identify a particular gene that's been separate. You know, it's usually a one amino acid substitution that, again, it changes the activity site for the fungus and it no longer works anymore. Same with the benzimidazoles. There's been one gene mutation, uh, again, a different amino acid been substituted. And again, the, that fungicide no longer works. Now the quantitative resistance like we see with the DMIs or the triazoles is a more gradual reduction control. So you can increase rates and you'll still be able to control it, but um, it's just not as effective as, as more. And you'll see um, if you get multiple mutations of several genes, then you can get you know, more of a, a total resistance as well. So that's, it's more of a range and which makes some of our surveys and I'll get into our surveys in a little minute. We don't really address that fact with our simple survey. Um, whereas some areas that they're doing more um, sophisticated, actually looking for the genes. We're not really set up for that um, to look for the resistance, see what their populations are doing. And so how does this occur? You know, I remember, you know, I've been at this game for a long time and I remember when we first started talking about resistance in school and a lot, you know, a lot of people always thought, well, you're applying these poisons or pesticides and that's actually causing mutations within the plant. Well, that, that's not really true. Um, the origin is there's, there's always rare genetic mutations out in the, um, the populations of the particular organisms you're looking at. So if you look at Cercospora, um, you have thousands and millions of different fungal isolates spread across the country. There's rare ones out there that actually have the genetic mutations already. And the way to drive this home is a great story. Again, going back to weed science, I remember Andrew talking about this, is a number of years ago, they looked at some old plant samples in a herbarium in France. And I believe the they were looking at some weeds and um, I think they were from the eight, mid 1800s. And on a whim, somebody said, you know what, let's, let's, let's look at the DNA structure of these plants. And they looked at a bunch of these different um, plant samples and they were lucky enough to stumble on a plant that actually had fungicide resistance in it. Um, which, so it had that genetic mutation. I forget what the fungicide was. I don't know if it was for Roundup or for 2,4-D or something, but they found that it actually had the gene mutation in there that enabled it to be resistant to fungicides, which actually hadn't even been invented for another 100 years. So basically, again, it's just rare genetic mutations out there. And of course, if we're using fungicides quite a bit, we have a lot of selection pressure in those populations. So we're selecting those resistant individuals to come out and become more prevalent in our populations. You know, the resistant individuals are more likely to survive and reproduce. So when the, when the fungus reproduces, then it typically it will pass on that mutation. It's an inheritable trait. So this kind of shows this really well. I really like um, this slide. This just shows um, if you get down here, you've got time and you've got fungicides and sense insensitivity. So as it goes up higher, um, the fungus becomes more resistant to a fungicide. And if you look at this line here that goes up real high over time, this is in a hypothetical situation where you're just using one chemistry. And this is what happened to us years ago when we started 
these wonder fungicides or wonder herbicides or wonder insecticides came out, growers will typically use what works the best. And so it's just only natural that people gravitated toward that. So they would use the same chemical over and over and over. And with time, we start selecting for the, the populations that are insensitive to that particular chemical. So that you can see here, using fungicide A only over time, you really build up populations because you're selecting for those populations that are insensitive to that fungicide. Now, in this scenario, if you rotate um, fungicides, you can kind of keep that in check. And so that's where the whole idea of using tank mixes really comes into play. You know, just like what Andrew was talking about, using tank mixes to control these different kind of fungicide or herbicide resistant weeds, it's very actually very important in fungicides as well. So we're actually going away um, from people relying on one chemistry class over and over and, and, and starting to use um, tank mixes and, and fungicide rotations. So we've been doing the Cercospor survey, I believe, as long as I've been here, I think it was the first years was like 1996 or something like that. And this was as we started seeing a little bit of fungicide resistance in the high plains sugar beet growing areas. And, um, you know, Western Sugar had asked us to do these surveys. And they also do surveys also in the Red River Valley. I believe they're doing it in Michigan as well, just kind of keep a, an eye on what kind of the populations are there. The way we do it is fairly cut and dry, it's pretty simplistic. Um, in the Red River Valley, they actually do, um, they have a lot of different PCR tests and things like that. And we're not really set up to do that because they have a, a dedicated person that that's all they do is they test um, throughout the year on these um, samples submitted by growers. Whereas we try to cram it all in a couple of months toward the end of the season. So we use a, just a basic poison media survey, which, which does work. It's not ideal, but it does give us some pretty good ideas on what's happening. And so the way this works, is we, and we've done it with you guys, I think two years maybe, um, we received a disease lease from the field. Um, and then we can actually store those and dry them and then do the survey later in the, when we're done with our field seasons. And so we've received samples from Colorado, Nebraska, Montana, Wyoming, we don't get a lot of samples. There's not a lot of beet production. I mean, you guys probably have the most beet production in your area than, than say in southeastern Wyoming, you don't have much anymore. Um, but so we've gotten limited samples from Wyoming. And again, we don't have the pressures as well as, as some of these other states. But then we'll, we'll recover the isolates and then test them on poison media to see how they grow in the presence of the fungus. I'm not gonna bore you with these techniques, but basically, again, this is what we do. We, we take the leaves, um, we rehydrate them, we excise the lesions that have those stroma, we plate those stroma on plates and then we start getting growth. And then we grow those things on um, the spore suspension. And then we've got all these cultures of fungus. And then we can actually then apply that fungus directly to plates that are and um, in they, they're amended with fungicides. Oops. Why is it doing that? Okay. So this is what it looks like. Um, these are some plates where we actually will put a spore suspension on the plate and then we measure the growth over time. So the idea is we have a check plate where there's no fungicide, so we we measure that amount of growth. And so the, here's a check plate. And then here's a plate that's been amended with super tin. And so you can see the growth is greatly reduced. So we do a percentage growth inhibition. And if it's up some kind of certain number, then we consider that isolate to be insensitive to that fungicide. So if that, if it's, if it's a resistant one, you'll typically see growth just as great as is if there is no fungicide present at all. So again, it's kind of a good test um, to show, um, you know, how these are working. Um, I've been criticized in the past. Well, some of these fungicides just inhibit spore growth. Some inhibit more hypo growth and that's true. But again, if we're inhibiting spore growth then we're not gonna get any growth at all. So again, it, it roughly correlates to what we, it's a quick and dirty way to do it. And um, 
we're probably not going to change um, some of our techniques. So these are some of the fungicides we've tested over the years. Uh, we look at the benzimidazoles. We've been looking at, uh, I don't think we look at Benlate anymore because again, Benlate is not even manufactured anymore, um, but we are looking at Topsin, which is thiophany methyl. Again, these have the both same modes of action. So if you have resistance to Benlate, you have resistance to Topsin and vice versa. We look at We've had looked at all the different strobilarins in the past, um, Quadris, Gem, and Headline. Now we just look at Headline, because Headline's basically the only one that's being used. Um, headline is the only one that, of the strobies works the best on Cercospora. Quadris, um, when it first came out, people did rely on it when we started seeing um, resistance to our um, um, Benlate, and they, they relied on Quadris, but Quadris really is not very good on Cercospora, so People don't use that that much anymore. Gem is about intermediate. It works okay. And, and some people are still using it in rotations, but headline by far was best against Cercospora. And so we just typically will look at, um, at the headline. So the triazoles, and there's a lot of them, there's Eminent, there's Tilt, there's Inspire, uh, there's Proline. And then there's the new one, Revisol, which we've tested. And again, Typically, if you get resistance to one of these, you're, you're going to have resistance to all of them. So they're all kind of the same mode of action. Now, Proline is kind of a weird one, and I'll talk to that a little bit too as well, because Proline, we used to see high levels of resistance in our fields, but uh, field efficacy was still pretty good. And the reason why is that um, one of the chemical reps finally confessed to me that Proline when it's absorbed by the plant actually breaks down to another product that's actually also fungicidal in nature. And so what our, our media tests don't address that. So um, Proline is actually still working fairly well in our region, even though our, um, our surveys were showing, God, as high as 35% of our fields are resistant to Proline. But again, because our survey was not, um, was with based within a Petri plate and not in the plant, we weren't showing that other active ingredient is being broken down. Revisol, you know, it's a new one, a lot of hype was involved about it, but it's, it's no better than any of the other um, triazoles. And we get resistance, of course, to that one, just like we do the other ones. And then we've been looking at super tin as well um, and how that does. So this is what we've been seeing um, this pulled up the past few years. We really didn't see a lot of resistance until about 2012, where resistance start, first started peaking up, especially with Benlate. So Benlate, most areas, that's where, we, this is the benzimidazole, is where we saw resistance occur first. Um, we were seeing up to 56% of the fields. This was the high point. 56% of the fields were resistant to that. And what we've been seeing is we've actually been seeing, a, um, it was kind of stable for a number of years, but lately it's been going down, um, which is kind of exciting. We had a student a number of years ago that did some research about this. So there's the whole idea of if you have a mutation that allows you to be uh, resistant to a particular pesticide, the, the idea is that mutation might come at some kind of physiological cost. Meaning if you've got that mutation, maybe you're not as good as your peers that don't have that mutation in the absence of the pesticide. And so we've done, we have done some research and the ones that had that one point mutation were basically this just as fit um, as the other ones that didn't have that mutation. So that kind of explained why we are seeing a persistence even in the absence of benz benzimidazole. Because after this point, you know, most people quit using benzimidazole. And so if it was an issue where the, those isolates were not as fit, then they would go away after a while. And I think that was the case with Supertin. You know, they built up high populations of, of the fungus that was resistant to Supertin. But as soon as they took Supertin out of the equation, those isolates started declining. I guess they just didn't compete as much um, with the regular Cercospora that had that mutation. But with benzaminazole, it didn't really matter that much. Um, there was a slight edge 
to the to the not having the mutation. And I think that's maybe why we're starting to see a gradual decline. And that's why a lot of growers are now starting to cautiously reintroduce Topsin into their spray schedules. And I kind of hold my breath when they do that, um, mostly down in Colorado, I've noticed. But if they have been mixing it with super tin, um, which greatly affects, helps pick up some of those resistant ice or those resistant isolates. So hopefully, you know, again, if we use proper rotations and tank mix, that we're not going to be selecting for those isolates again too much because it does work pretty well. It is a, um, it's one of those fungicides that, that does translocate throughout the plant. Um, most of our DMIs are still working pretty well in our region. Um, we've had about 10 up to 13% of the fields that have some resistant isolates to these. Um, again, here's that proline 56%. And again, that's because of that weirdness um, with the way the proline works in the plant. So we're not really testing that one anymore. Super 10, we're not seeing a lot of um, resistance out there. And so for the most part, a lot of our chemistries are still working pretty well. And the reason why that is, you know, why are we different from River River Valley or Michigan? Well, those guys, again, they're spraying so much. Um, there's a lot more selection pressure in those regions. They have a lot higher disease pressures than we do. And so obviously they're going to develop fungicide resistance much quicker and at a higher level than we are. So for the most part, we're still doing pretty well. Um, again, if we use good uses of tank mixes and, and rotations of fungicides, I don't anticipate um, a huge crash. Of course, if there's anything different, you guys let me know at the end of this because um, especially during the pandemic sitting in my home, I'm not hearing a lot of reports of what's happening out there in sugar beet fields. So you guys did give us some samples. Um, this is from 2017. I couldn't find another set of data. I'm pretty sure we've done it for 10 years, but or two, two years. But we did find um, pretty much resistance to most, most of the uh, cases, you know, of small areas. I think it was mostly around the river. I can't remember which, um, which grower it was, but we did find um, a very few number of isolates. There were a few insensitive isolates to inspire on uh, the DMI. Um, and then the strobe in the headline, and then to the benlate. So they are present in our, in our region. Um, so just be aware of that, that, and which is not surprising me again, since it's a, you know, it's a rare genetic mutation within the populations. You got to assume that these populations that we have here, even a limited area like Worland, that's kind of in an isolated pocket within the state, we're going to have that resistance present in the populations. So the problem is, you know, we don't have a lot of tools in our toolkit for different fungicides. Again, like I said, we have the benzimidazoles, pretty much just limited to topsin. We have the strobilarins, again, pretty much limited to headline um, and also preaxor, which has headline in it. And then the triazoles, there's quite a few, you know, like proline, eminent, inspire. And then the, the new one, Revisol. I think actually they changed the name. I can't remember the name of it. But then we have the old standbys too, which are the EBDCs like Manzate um, or Pencozeb, and then Super Tin, and then the coppers like, uh, you know, the copper sulfates. These have good protective action. They, they're non-systemic, they're protectants. These were the old standbys that we used to use before um, benzimidazole or the systemic fungicides came out. So in the old days, they pretty much relied on these EBDCs, super tins, coppers to control Cercospora. And then they used varieties that had a little bit higher tolerance um, to the fungus. So those, those tolerant varieties weren't great yielders. And so once the new fungicides came out, um, they really started, the seed companies and the sugar companies really started pushing the more higher yielding hybrids that were more susceptible to Cercospora. And so we managed Cercospora in the past by just using these, these really good systemic fungicides. 
And so of course that worked great for a number of years, but then we started getting the resistance build up. So a lot of areas are starting to look at these chemistries again, um, especially in tank mixes. They don't work that great on their own. I remember looking at some of these and some of our spray trials and they may just, you know, like 60% effectiveness basically um, compared to say something like Topsin or some of the triazoles, which we are pushing 90 plus percent control of Circospora. So we're finding that um, especially these hard hit areas like Red River Valley in Michigan, they're starting to rely on these again pretty heavily for tank mixes. Also, there's other reasons why I have poor results in terms of fungicides. This was a Red River Valley um, survey that they did in terms of, you know, why we had poor uh, Circospora control. And they did this survey and they found that, you know, timing was a big issue. Um, especially that first fungicide application. So this is a tough one to call because when we had a meeting, we had a meeting lat or two years ago in Fargo with all the sugar beet cooperatives around the country, all kind of focused on this problem. And they were kind of charging us researchers with different areas to look at. And one area was how do we predict disease better? We do have the, the disease model, which eh, it works okay, but um, some people feel like it's not representing some of the newer isolates better. Um, and they've, they've tweaked it somewhat. And I think it's still somewhat of an issue because all that does, it bases on the environment. Again, when you have disease, you have to have three things happen. You have to have a susceptible host. You have to have the pathogen and you have to have the proper environment. The predictive models just focus on environment. It assumes you have the fungus somewhere out there. And of course you've got a susceptible host. So the predictive models look just at environmental conditions. So the predictive models are looking at um, relative humidity and temperature basically. So they're looking at periods of relative humidity and temperature that are good for spore germination and establishment. So that's what those are based on. So because of that, sometimes people maybe don't use the model or the model doesn't work very well or their fungicide is just delayed because of weather, which happens a lot, especially in the Red River Valley where they get more rains than we do. And so 86% of their pore control is attributed a lot of times just to, they can't get the fungicide out early enough. And that happens a lot of times too in these areas, especially if you're applying the air or you don't have your own spray rig and you're dependent on others, you can't get it in there very, at an early type application. Another reason is poor application. Um, they found a lot of growers will tend to use not as much gallonage, so they don't have to come in so much to fill up on the tanks. Um, but they found that um, you get their best results by using about 15 to 20 gallons per acre at least, um, just to get good coverage of, those, of that crop canopy. If you think about a sugar beet crop canopy, it's pretty thick. Those are big leaves. And if you're not using a lot of um, carrier, you don't get a lot of penetration. Interval too long. Again, they're waiting too long in between applications, um, especially if they're using a protectant fungicide, they eventually will weather off within two weeks. The systemics, you can go a lot of times three weeks in between applications. Again, fungicide rate too low is also attributed. You know, people were trying to be cheap and not use the higher rates. And so they were using two row of a late. Um, cultivar susceptibility, again, a lot of the cultivars that have been pushed by the sugar companies are these high yielding hybrids that had no resistance to Circospora. You know, weather, um, you know, and then also other issues like no fungicide or they stop too early and things like that. So it just kind of points toward different kind of issues that we do have somewhat some control over. And this is actually, and I'll, I'll cover this at the end of the talk, um, directing some of our research. No Avenue graduate student. She's actually from a beet farm in Michigan. And we're looking at some of these issues of um, fungicide timing and also efficacy um, using more gallonage and things like that. So of course, what are the solutions? And so using resistant varieties. So a lot of sugar companies and we do have tolerant Circospora varieties out there that can do fairly well in the presence of Circospora. They just don't yield very well. And so there was a lot, 
you know, they always have that term yield drag. And so there's been a lot of reluctance to use these. So there's a new variety from KWS and it's called the CR plus. And so supposedly this new hybrid, and I don't know that much information about it. They kind of introduced this to us at the um, Western Sugar meeting this year. And um, I just kind of briefly heard about it. There's not a lot of data about it. I went to their website and it's coming out of Minnesota. And I think Beta is gonna, is gonna produce or, or develop the seed. So I don't even know if they have a Roundup Ready seed of this yet, but basically this, this hybrid supposedly has pretty good tolerance to circosperates, but still yields pretty well. So that's kind of exciting. So actually we got some of this seed and my graduate student is gonna be looking at this in the greenhouse and we're gonna compare it. She's running experiments now. Where we're actually looking at fitness of these different um, resistant isolates to see how they compare to a um, susceptible isolate on different varieties. So she has a susceptible variety. She's got a very resistant variety. And now we're gonna look at this CR plus one. And basically, and I have a slide that kind of shows this, that shows how resistance basically reduce, just reduces everything in that fungus and reduces its ability to reproduce quickly. And I'll show you that. So there's some fair amount of excitement about this. I mean, I went to their website and of course there's a lot of anecdotal evidence and a lot of hype, so I don't know how much to believe, but I'm hoping within a couple of years or sooner, um, some of these varieties will be developed for our region. So, I mean, this is something our industry really needs because we're really reeling from this problem um, with the resistance, especially in some of those areas hardest hit like Red River Valley in Michigan. Um, so this could really improve our um, battle against Circospora. And of course, the other solution is rotate your chemistries. And I think most growers have been doing a pretty good job of that. We've been getting um, information from um, Western Sugar and what they're doing. And for the most part, growers are rotating their chemistries and using mixtures. I'm not sure if they're still using full rates. They, they probably are. Um, so using full rates, even in the mixtures, um, and rotating those chemistries. You know, if you can use the higher gallonage, 15 to 20 gallons, um, and maybe a little bit higher pressure to get it into the ground. So I realize a lot of times when you get those rows closed and people are running their pivot 24 hours, they can't go into the ground rig and they have to use air. And so that's one thing we're gonna look at with, with uh, Amanda's research is we're actually gonna try to mimic that where we're using different gallonages to mimic between the two to see really what the, the cost penalty of that is. And that's why we're also looking at earlier sprays. Um, and I'm talking before row closure to see if that has any application. Because if you think about it, if you spray just before row closure, you can still get a ground rig through. And so maybe that first, at least that first application anyway, you can use a ground rig and use higher gallonage and you just get better overall control maybe that will be good rather than just using aerial for all your applications. So that's something we're kind of trying to look at. We did have a study on the ground this year, but our, our sarcosphere was pretty poor. I do have some numbers and I'll have to look at it. So we did get some differences, but I haven't um, crunched the numbers yet on that. We're gonna repeat that study this year. But a lot of people are restricted to aerial, but then you can use your highest volume as practical, three to five gallons. And when you think about rotations, also take in consideration what you use the previous season. So if you end your season on a, um, a triazole, you don't want to start next season with a triazole. You want to switch it out. So even on the following year, you want to kind of be mindful of what you sprayed the previous year. Um, longer rotations, crop rotations, you know, we have a lot of, we, we're pretty limited on our crop rotations in our areas. And so, you know, some people are going to a four year rotation, which may not work in our regions, um, but the longer you can rotate, um, the better you can reduce that amount of inoculum. Now, the problem is with Circospora, um, and, and this has been established, we just don't know how much of a problem it is. 
it will readily go to a lot of our common weeds that we have here. It'll go to pigweeds. It'll go to, I, I believe, kochia, and it definitely goes to lamb's quarters. And so even in your crop rotations, if you still have those weeds and you're not getting great weed control, Cercospora can still persist in those weeds. So even if you have good rotations, and because those that crop residue will eventually break down and those stroma and those things won't be effective anymore. But if you have weeds out there with infections, you can still have that disease kind of persisting. Now, Andrew um, touched on this, tank mix is maybe better than a single chemistry rotation. I haven't really seen any data on this, but I think it just makes sense to me um, where if you use a tank mix where you've got different modes of action within that spray, it's probably to be better than using fungicide A and then fungicide B on the next spray. I think that a tank mix is probably gonna be better um, and, and he did find that to be true with um, herbicide resistant weeds. I'm guessing it's probably true um, with, the, with the fungus as well, um, that where the tank mix might be a little bit better than using rotations of chemistries. So they found that Super 10 and some of these EBDCs are good tank mix partners. Um, they don't interfere with the other tank mix. A lot of these compounds are pretty cheap. And so a lot of places are throwing in Super 10 throwing in Manzate or Pencozib. Um, you know, in the past, it's not labeled, and I think they might be looking at labeling it again, is chlorothalonil. Um, chlorothalonil also had some activity against Cercospora. You know, again, not great, but again, it's a whole nother mode of action that maybe people will look at. But I don't know what the status of um, what people are looking at in terms of trying to get that um, registered. So these are the main programs that Western Sugar is doing anyway. So for our region, growers are either applying zero times or one to two times. Rarely have I seen anybody spraying three times. And so a lot of people are using um, Minerva Duo, which is, um, I think, I believe it's Eminent or a Triazole plus Super 10. So it comes pre-packaged, this is kind of really nice. It's already pre-packaged tank mix. And so a lot of people are starting to use that quite a bit with good effect. Um, some were spraying Minerva Duo, then followed by Preaxor. Um, I'm not sure why people use, and I could be wrong in this. I don't know. Preaxor has another, it is a mix as well. It's um, Headline Plus, oh, I can't remember the other compound, but I don't believe that other compound has much effect on Cercospora. In fact, I, one of the chemical reps said, yeah, Headline does most of the heavy lifting in Preaxor um, compared to the other one. So I don't, and I'm, I don't know what the cost differences are either. Maybe Headline's a little cheaper. I would just use Headline basically. I don't know, and I could be totally wrong. Um, I need to check on this more, but, um, I do know a lot of people use Preaxor, but I don't know how effective that other mix is in there. Um, some are using Proline with Super 10 and then a followed by Preaxor. And some are using Super 10 plus Topsin followed by Minerva Duo. You know, this one looks pretty good because it's got basically two tank mixes um, subsequent using it. So this one has a 10 plus a benzaminazole and then this one has a DMI plus a 10. So again, you know, those tank mixes with Super 10 are really nice. And you can use Super 10 or Agar 10. I think there's probably other ones out there. So the, the generic ones work just as well. They're probably cheaper. Um, Minerva Duo is a, basically a generic eminent, I believe. And so they, so some of these um, generics um, seem to do just as well as the higher price brand ones. So, these other regions, especially in the uh, in the Red River Valley in Michigan, they're they're doing a lot of tins mixed with coppers and EBDCs, um, or triazoles mixed with coppers and EBDCs. We're not seeing a lot of that yet in our regions where they're using the coppers um, or the EBDCs, but they are relying on them pretty heavily in some of those harder hit areas because if they're spraying six times a year, you know they've got a really 
change it up quite a bit. Their resistance again is a lot more present than ours. So we haven't really seen a lot of um, the coppers of the EBDCs being used extensively in our region. Um, here again, here's the common, some of the common fungicides being used. So cosite is a good example of a, of a copper. Dithane or mancozeb for the EBDC. Topsin or super tenth or benzimidazole, or I mean, sorry, um, Topsin is your benzimidazole. Um, I don't know. I wonder if there's, there might be a generic one of that out there too, is, is my guess. Super 10, agar 10, uh, basically. And this is kind of nice because it shows um, the FRAC number. So the FRAC is the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee. And so that's something to pay attention when you come up with these um, tank mixes. And you don't want to follow chemistries that have the same FRAC number. So strobilarin has a FRAC number of 11. So that means all the strobilarins, including gem, quadris, are all going to have that 11 number. So that means if you've got resistance developed, you don't want to follow with them. Even though it's a different compound or a different product, it's going to have the same mode of action. So basically, this refers to the mode of action. The triazoles have a FRAC number of three. So again, all those triazoles are going to have the same mode of action. So they're going to have the same FRAC number. So again, you need to pay attention to those um, to make sure you're not following those or tank mixing. Like it doesn't make sense to tank mix proline and eminent. I mean, you're tank mixing basically the same mode of action. So be aware of those frac numbers. They are, they are on the label. Oh, so here it is. Floaxa, flu, floaxa pyro, peroxide. Sorry, I can't pronounce them very well. Um, plus fraclostrobin. So again, there is a 7-Eleven um, actually in there. So, um, so it does have a tank mixture, but again, I don't know how effective this one is. I, you know, it may have some effect, but it's not great on, on Cercospora. So Minerva Duo, which is a triazole and a 10, so you have a three and a 30. Super 10 is a 30, of course. Um, Topsin is a one. And then the Mancozeb, um, or the EBDCs is an M3. So it's got an M there because that means it's got um, multiple sites of action. So that's even better. You know, all these have a one site action activity on the fungus. Um, the EBDCs are kind of generalists. And so they have multiple sites. And so that makes their, um, their ability to get resistance to it pretty, pretty remote. Um, the, you don't get a whole lot of resistance to these compounds. Um, number one, they don't, they don't work super great, so there's always escapes. And also there's multiple sites that works on that fungus. So it's really hard for those funguses to come up with a resistance to that. Uh, the same with coppers, multiple sites, it's an M1. And then if you look at efficacy, um, these, this is based on uh, Michigan sugar trials. They found that headlines not working very well there because again, they have so much resistance. It still works fairly well in our region. Uh, Proline is still working pretty well. Eminent, Inspire, so the, most of the DMIs. Preaxor is not working that great again because it's got headline in it. And again, they've got a lot of strobilin resistance there. Uh, the Minerva Duo and Super 10 are working well. And then these, um, old standbys, they just work fair. Like I said, again, these maybe are 60% effective by themselves on, on Cercospora. So that's kind of interesting in terms of the um, efficacy, these trials that, that Michigan puts out. So when you throw, I mentioned there's a resistant variety down the pike and, and what resistance does is kind of interesting. You know, and this is something I harp on my, on my students when I teach my class that when you have a resistant variety, it usually does not mean it is totally resistant to a pathogen. Um, it just means the pathogen will establish itself, but it just doesn't grow as quickly. And, and this is what happens. So basically it slows everything down or throws a lot of roadblocks bro in front of that fungus to complete its life cycle when there's a resistance in the plant. And so, some of the, if you look at different disease parameters and you look at a resistant versus susceptible host, um, there are changes, subtle changes that occur that's, 
that basically slow down disease. And so incubation period, that's the period from when a spore lands on a, on a, on a leaf surface, you start getting symptoms develop. So basically how fast it develops within the plant and producing symptoms. A resistant variety basically is gonna reduce that time. And so you might get an additional 12 day delay um, compared to resistant variety. So again, it's slowing that fungus down. It's throwing a lot of roadblocks at it. It doesn't develop that quick. Inoculation efficiency, that's basically for a given amount of inoculum being plant, placed on a plant, you know, how many lesions do you get from that? And so if you have a very efficient inoculum, let's say you have a hundred spores that land on a plant and maybe 67 of them produce lesions, that's a pretty good inoculation efficiency. So again, having a resistant variety is gonna reduce that number. And so it's gonna reduce that ability of that spore to germinate and to establish infection. You know, lesion size, you know, again, if you've got a resistance variety, it's gonna limit that spread of that pathogen. And so it's effectively gonna reduce that lesion size. So Amanda's doing that work now. We've had a couple of runs in the greenhouse looking at these different isolates. Um, we have a, we have a strobilarin resistant isolate and a benzamidazole resistant isolate, and then an isolate that's susceptible. And we're looking how they, how quick they develop on different hybrids. So we have, we had a resistant variety and a susceptible variety. And we were finding that lesion size um, was fairly the same, but inoculation efficiency was greatly affected. I think we had 50% less lesions on the resistant variety versus the susceptible one. So that kind of holds up within this table. Um, we we're just finding that it just didn't produce as much. What we were finding, which was interesting, some of the resistant isolates were behaving differently. So we were actually finding um, more disease on the first run um, with the benzamide, I, I might get this wrong, but the benzamidazole resistant isolate, or maybe it was the strobilan resistant isolate, was producing more disease compared to the susceptible isolate. So, but then it flip-flopped the next time we did the study. And I was kind of scratching my head why that might be occurring. And then I, I talked to my um, colleague, Linda Hansen, who's done a lot of research on Cercosper. She's, at, um, she's with the USDA and she's now located um, at near Michigan State. And so she's finding that um, temperature has a lot, an effect on these different isolates. And so that's maybe why we see, um, when we see those fluctuations of populations from year to year, because on our greenhouse trial, she did one trial in the fall and did another one in the winter. And the winter, the greenhouses are typically much colder than in the winter. So we're, that we're seeing maybe some effect on that. So she's going to try to repeat these in the same same time frame um, again this um, spring when it's still kind of cool, and then again this fall. Also, spore yield. Um, if you have a resistant variety, again they don't typically produce as many spores, and so all these have a cumulative effect of really reducing disease. So that's basically how tolerant hybrids work. They're not. It's not an immunity for, you know, there's very rare instances where you have them, hybrids that are immune to a disease. A lot of them will have some disease, um, but basically um, different varying degrees of it. Um, but basically they're just slowing down that disease um, spread in the plant. So I'm getting close to the end here. We did, so for Amanda's work, we did a, a quick survey too, to kind of establish I had mentioned we were looking at some different kind of techniques in the, in the field. And we asked them what initiated their first spray, okay? And this was in for 2019. And basically we um, surveyed all the different um, field representatives for the sugar companies, so all the different states, and we compiled this data. And we found that over half of the growers were relying on the prediction model. So half of them were using the prediction model. When the prediction model said to spray, they sprayed. 
Another 28% were looking at first lesions, okay? So they're waiting for the first lesions to occur before that occurred. Now, I don't know if that means they're actively scouting their fields or it's just when they first start noticing disease. Now, the problem with that one is a lot of times um, you're already fighting a losing battle because you get those first lesions established. Um, you, have a lot of, you have a lot more disease that's present out there. Um, when we look at total disease, you're looking at symptomatic and then stuff that hasn't become symptomatic yet. So there's a lot of disease out there. You just haven't seen, they're still in the incubation period. You just haven't seen the results yet. So a lot of times those first lesions are misleading because there's probably a lot more disease out there. About 4% were based on what their neighbor was doing. So yeah, there's still a few people that kind of just rely on what their neighbors were doing. And 14% in 2019 didn't even apply anything. So again, that's indicative of our region. Some areas just don't have a lot of sarcospor pressure. <clears throat> then we asked them how they were applying this. And this one was kind of interesting to me too. Um, the percentage of acres sprayed either by aerial ground or chemigation. And I was surprised, you know, 65% were using aerial, 33% were using ground, and then only 2% using chemigation. So that's why we, we kind of came up with some of these ideas. I had done some research, oh gosh, it was 2011, 2012, maybe 2013, where I was looking at how does early sprays for rhizoctonia affect sarcospor? And the whole idea was, you know, you're applying a fungicide pretty early in the season. Um, does that have any effect on sarcospor later in the season? Because a lot of the chemicals we use for rhizoctonia do have activity on sarcospor. And I did that for three years. And I found in one year out of three, I actually reduced sarcospor disease. So this, I didn't actually apply any other fungicides for sarcospor, just kind of let it go wild in the plots and kind of measured it. And I found that an early spray was kind of accounting for some disease um, success. So we thought, well, why don't we just spray early, maybe the week before row closure and to see if that improves anything. And like I said before, we had very poor disease this year, but our early spray, I had an early spray and then I followed it up with, um, again, a spray at row closure and then that was it compared to another spray that was at row closure then two weeks later. And I found those two were the same um, for our particular environment or our particular conditions of disease pressure this year. So. My whole idea of why to do that is, again, if a grower is relying strictly on aerial applications, and if you have a ground rig, if you can go in there early and spray, you're gonna get better efficacy of your spray, and also maybe it's a little cheaper. I, I don't know, maybe some, somebody told me there wasn't much difference in cost, but timeliness, I think, would be better as well. So we, we, we kind of initiated that, and we're also looking at um, we're mimicking using different spray nozzles, mimicking carrier volume to see how that affects um, applications as well. And I did find when we were using higher gallonage, we did, yes, lo and behold, to no surprise, we did get better sarcosporous um, management control. But again, I've got to crunch the numbers. And again, we have pretty um, poor disease pressure this year. I think that's all I have. If you guys have any questions for me. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. We do have a question here. Okay. Bill Vance Lundgren. Thank you. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Good, good. Uh, in regards to the early spray applications and uh, reference to the prediction models, I, I think that it's important for our area that we follow the prediction model because we can't afford to spend any dollars that might not be doing a job out there a little too early. Right. And especially where some of our growers, we have to beg them to spray once. Uh, we need to make, get the most out of that spray as we can. And it's really not a problem uh, for these guys to go into the fields, even with a ground rig later. 
because um, we're, we're making a later application of Roundup anyway, and, and uh, it doesn't disturb too much of that canopy doing that. So we're strongly recommending on our end that the guys are spraying with 20 to 25 gallons per acre, per acre. or chemigating through sprinklers. So we're uh, trying to get away from the aerial applications uh, because I just don't feel like we're getting the penetration of the canopy and the disease control. So, well, it sounds like you guys are doing all the right things. I think, you know, these early applications, I'm just kind of trying it based on that early research. And for our region, honestly, it's probably not going to work very well for the reason you indicated, because our pressure is a little bit more iffy year to year. I think in the areas like Red River Valley, they may benefit somewhat from some of these earlier applications when they know they're going to have disease. Um, but in areas where it's kind of iffy, yeah. And that's that's cool because you know, you know, Amanda says, you know, Michigan, they pretty much use ground rigs all the time. I was kind of surprised, you know, 64% were using aerial applications, um, you know, in Nebraska, Colorado, Montana areas um, for the most part, because I just don't think it works as well. So, yeah, so I think, you know, the prediction models are, are fairly, uh, they have been kind of um, hard to rely on in the past too. We have put out some new monitors um, that are easier to, to receive the data from and collect the data, put it together. So we're going out with a few more of those this year. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get some uh, good results there, but it's, you know, we've had years where it said, you need to spray. Uh, our infection values are are above the threshold to spray, um, but we don't see any spots. Guys, go out there. We've had years where uh, it's not telling us to spray, but all of a sudden we see spots. So it's been pretty tough to uh, adjust that prediction model to our particular area. But yeah, and we had the same problem. We, we're um, Wendy Cecil, who's doing my field work this season, um, was relying on the prediction model that was coming out of, I think it was coming out of uh, Goshen County, and we never did get a spray indication at all. And you saw those yield results. Of course, we had a weird, we had a lot of weed pressure and, and drought issues, but just having a little bit of disease in there just slammed our yields. And so, I, yeah, the disease model definitely needs tweaking. Um, I don't know, you know, those those were developed quite a while ago, maybe 20 years ago or so. And um, and there's been reports that Circospora may be doing better at lower temperatures now than we used to think, and maybe even different relative humidity. So perhaps no no doubt it's probably adapted to our area. Just a heads up, you know, as far as our farm, um, we saw it in every single field this year. So, okay. Uh, you know, a lot of the fields, it wasn't at an economic threshold or even close, but it was present in every field. And that's, you know, that's uh, something that's been increasing over the years. Um, you know, I think we, our first huge case of it probably came about 12 years ago. So, um, but we've pretty much got it everywhere. And I think if we were going to throw money at something, it should be a later application just to help uh, knock back the spore load that we would be uh, carrying over for the next the, the next years. So, but right. uh, one other um, work with some spreader stickers uh, would be nice to see. I think there's okay. data out there, um, and and maybe that would help some of these uh, applications, especially those that have to do it aerially. That we might get a little more efficacy out of that those applications. I'll see if I can find. I'm guessing Michigan and Minnesota, North Dakota has done some of that work. So I'll see if I can find some of that data. Okay. Thanks. And then we'll we'll try and do it too. But we have, we haven't really done a lot of work with that. I mean, you know, we typically will use um, some kind of spreader with the um, trizoles usually. Um, usually the, the, whatever the company recommends, we typically will use, um, but it might be more of an issue in some certain chemistries, but again, yeah, I, I, I'll look to see if there's been much work done on that. Bill, what did you say, how long does that, do the spores last in the soil? 
Um, just spores, they won't last very long. They might last the season, but after one year, most will be dead. But the stromata, those will persist maybe up to two years or so. You know, the little black specks. They're not lasting the between um, sugar beet crops from the, in the same field. They're coming in from somewhere. This, um, they could be persisting. I, you know, we had a student that did some work where he was looking where he was actually burying those lesions in the soil. And he found after a couple of years, most of them were dead, but there's still a few. It doesn't take a lot. But I think where a lot of this stuff is coming in, it's your weedy border rows and things like that, um, if they've got it in there. Because I've been told, and I've been told that Cercosper spores don't go that far, like 100 yards, which to right. me doesn't make sense. And that was one thing that they wanted us to maybe look at was it spore detection. And Muhammad Khan had done quite a bit of that work. And so had um, people in Idaho looking at spore traps and see if that's a viable way to do it. And the short answer was not really. I mean, it's really, it's, you're looking at a needle in a haystack kind of thing. Um, I, I did kind of want to look at, see how far this stuff is moving. Cause I have a hard time believing, especially with our wind in Wyoming, that it is not going more than a hundred yards, but yeah. Yeah, some of the research has shown that, that that, that really long needle like it just kind of tumbles. It's not very aerodynamic. And so I think a lot of the disease is coming in within the field and on the borders. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I don't, I don't see any, any more questions, um, but okay. I appreciate your time. Thank you. All right. We'll see you guys later. So, so better. Um, I I did put together a good presentation for you on no-till. If anybody's interested, if you have other things to do today and you're not interested in you can do, that's fine. We do have one thing that I'm doing for you. I know there are a few folks um, that I just saw um, get on Zoom that I know would ask me about that topic in particular. So I will give that talk and would be happy to share that with you all if you're interested. Um, but I'll give you a few minutes break if you need to get up and, and walk around. Um, so that one went pretty long, but hopefully you all got some good information out of it and that might be somewhat live. It's kind of a information heavy this morning. 